Mysteries of Egypt, Part 1, with Ben from Uncharted X. You are listening to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. And we are back from Egypt, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, angels and demons, monsters and serpents. This is Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. And we are doing a swap cast with Ben, the Dread Ben Kirkwick. From the excellent... Our fearless leader. Our fearless leader from the excellent Uncharted X channel. And we are once again nestled amongst the dusty bones of an ancient seabed here on the Edwards Plateau. And uh, yeah, what an amazing trip. And uh, we do plan on continuing the Path of the Pole book report. But of course, we're going to be pumping out some Egypt episodes since we just got back from there. And this first one, we're... we. We wanted Ben to join us. Uh, just we're going to do a recap, I think, and discuss maybe some of the things we learned. Ben, thank you so much for joining us, buddy. Guys, thanks for uh, having me on again. It's always a pleasure uh, to chat with you, particularly after these trips. Just uh, this was such an epic trip. Yeah, it's good to actually do a recap and try and run through all the things that we saw and the people we talked to and the discoveries that were made and the mysteries that were solved. Yes. <laughs> were a couple. Were there any mysteries solved? I don't know. There was. Were there? At least. <laughs> yeah, there was a few, man. There were yeah, some there taste was. tests that happened. You know? <laughs> 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 All right. So before we before we dive into the recap, though, we are joined by the Watcher. He is deep beneath his secret space station in secret outer space. Brett, buddy, thanks for joining us, man. How you doing? Very excited to hear the tales of the Giza Plateau and the rest of Egypt. Super, super stoked. Yeah. Last time you guys came back, I uh, I was able to pick up on a bunch of new thoughts and ways to look at things. And uh, it was great. I'm looking forward to doing it all over again. Blow my mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, what we really need to do is get you out there with us one of these trips. Yeah, bro. You just need to show yeah. up, buddy. Just, you know, do a crash landing in the in the you know <laughs> in the desert and we'll pick you up you're, you're telling me you want me to crash in egypt in a spaceship and you think that that's not going to cause a riot <laughs> <laughs> the aliens have returned way. well it's just the watcher it's okay it's all right but yeah we need to get you out there sometime so we'll do that at some point all right i think the first thing i wanted to say uh is to the entire group that was out there yep. with us. You guys were amazing. We had an absolutely fantastic group of people with us. Uh, and, you know, Egypt is special. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's a very unique place. But to see it with all of you and the bonds that f were formed and the, you know, the, uh, all the, uh, the discussions we had on deck mixed with alcohol and music and rock and roll. I mean, just, it's, there's just nothing better. Also <laughs> pool. There was a lot of Games of pool played. I destroyed all of them. <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. I got my ass kicked yeah. too many times. And what about Ben? What about the beer order? The infamous uh. <laughs> beer order. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I have a great video of that. Yeah, yeah. I forgot all about that. Till you just mentioned it. Yeah, that was it faded out. But yeah, that was that was. That was the time. Yeah. Mo turned it was an adventure in, in, in and of itself. Yeah. Mo turned it yeah. over to Ben. He was just like, I can't handle this. You do it. And then I go I go over there and I'm like, hey, I'm going to bed. Here's here's my suitcase for getting beer. And Ben looks up sweating. <laughs> He's got piles of cash on the table. He's trying to count what's going on. <laughs> Man, it was an epic adventure. Oh my God. That was one of my favorite parts. <laughs> getting that all was that interesting. booze. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they had felt somehow felt somehow illegal, even though it wasn't. <laughs> right, I know. <laughs> it I was trying to be nonchalant, standing on the street with like five or six other people with a bunch of suitcases, with a, <laughs> some weird beat up Volkswagen, just like loading all this <laughs> booze in up. there, just like <laughs> <laughs> nothing to see here, folks. Right, <laughs> right. So if it isn't clear, we Ben had to borrow five or six suitcases. Oh yeah! In order to get all the beer from the place they bought it onto the boat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's. Uh, they do sell the booze on the boat, but it's much cheaper if you uh, buy it from. Uh, I think it's Drinkies.net in Egypt. Yeah. Actually, you can. Uh, so there was some bulk orders placed, and yeah, it's like one guy in this car just had to just rolled up with the back of it just loaded down with beer and wine and a few <laughs> bottles of really gnarly uh, Egyptian spirits. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure some of it doubles as paint thinner, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when you're getting a bottle of gin for three dollars, I'm really not sure. Oh, it's, it's going to be worth your time. You yeah, know? 
But uh, hey, I yeah, drank some fun. of that vodka. It was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, oof. Might have drank too much of that vodka, and it was pretty good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> There's a bit of that going around. It was good, yes. And I would echo your uh, sentiment about thank you to everybody that was on the trip. It was, yeah, I just, I, I you know, every trip's been fantastic, uh, but this in particular, this group, I guess, and it, part, partially because this was the, um, you know, the contact at the cabins. We had the Darren and Graham from Grow America there as well. We'd kind of been planning this trip for a couple of years. And yeah. so there were a lot of familiar faces, a lot of people yeah. that had been to the Scabland, you know, um, trips. And, yeah, everybody was uh, kind of fired up and, and just energized. Everybody got together. I mean, I'm even including the the back of the green bus crew in that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it was, a, it was a great time and, and made better by the company. And it was – even though it was a large group, I think it worked out really well. Uh, yeah. I, I couldn't have been happier with it. So. Yep. I also want to say what's up to all of my friends, my very close friends there in, in the group, pretty much everybody, yeah. uh, just had so much fun with all of you and I miss all of you. Yeah. And, uh, damn, I hope we get to do it again. Yes. Yes. All right. So on to the mysteries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we got, first thing, we got into a couple of places we hadn't been in before. At least I hadn't. Uh, and I know one, one of them, Ben, hadn't been in there either. Yusuf hadn't even been in there. No, and even like, um, was it Dr. Hassanin and this guy's like 50, 60-year-old Egyptologist traveling with us that hadn't, yeah, nobody had been in this one place. So I was really, really excited to get in there. And we we sprung it on the group as a surprise. I like to... If we can organize kind of surprise special permissions and little things that aren't on the itinerary, we try to do them and do yeah. it. And uh, you know, a couple. I think it was at um, last year we 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 surprised people with the step pyramid going beneath the step pyramid. That's right, which is a huge deal. Like if you guys have seen the videos on that, the stuff that's amazing. We'll, we'll talk more about that because we went down there again on this trip. But yeah, and this, on this trip, it, we we actually pulled off a couple of special sort of surprise permissions. But the big one for me that I'd been kind of working with Yusuf and Mo. For I mean more than a year. Oh, did I just drop out? No. Nope. Got a, Okay. Um, something's going on on my computer here. It's fine. It was um, uh, the Sphinx Temple. Yes. So this is, if people don't know the Sphinx Temple, it's like if you imagine looking at the Sphinx, you, you know, you're looking at it. You got the pyramids in the background. You've got kind of the Valley Temple. It's that massive granite structure that you know the granite casing stones over the limestone structure. And just to the right of that, there's another similar structure that's been closed forever like it's literally you go and look at it and the gates are welded shut and you can kind of peer in there and have a little look in there it's quite a mysterious area of the giza plateau and as far as i know very very few people have ever gotten in there certainly it's never been a special permission that's been offered uh, as you said yusuf's lived there his whole life never been in there right uh every these guys that work in the you know tourism industry the egyptologist had never been in there uh muhammad hassan the the our our you know, hieroglyphic expert had never been in there. They, so it was a real treat for everyone, and uh, we got to we got to go in there um, and explore it, and it was it was pretty mind blowing. Yeah, that was a, a really cool place. So something I'd been wanting to do forever, and we filmed the hell out of it, and there will be content. Yes, yes. yeah, and it was a so such a strange place. It is. It was. I don't know. To me, walking around in there, you know, it was, and this might be. In part because no one has been in there for so long. What has it been closed since the '60s? Something like that, closed to the public since. It, I don't know specifically. I mean, for me, when I was researching it, the best resource I had was like Robert Temple. Uh, he, the photos I saw of it, and particularly that the one that drain that U-shaped block that's in there, the granite block. Oh yeah. I mean, I've seen black and white photos of that, and it was in his book. Now I'm sure he took them in color, but you know, he reproduced them in his book in black and white, and he has a little he has a lecture where he talks about it. Uh, I haven't read his book. I'm sure he talks more about it. I know what his theory is for what that particular thing was. But, yeah, I hadn't seen, like, color photos or certainly no video uh, yeah. that you can find inside the Sphinx Temple. So, yeah, it's it's it was really cool getting in there. It has a lot of really interesting features. I, I really need to study the footage that you get in there. You know, you, you kind of go into these new spaces, and it's it's great because I think this is the experience everybody has when they first go to Egypt for the first time. It's certainly what people – tell me is that it's it's kind of all overwhelming you know when you go yeah. to the Giza for the first time you look at the pyramids or something for the first time it's there's so many things jumping out at you and and everything's new and and interesting and there's 
too many details to kind of take in at once. So that's absolutely how I felt in the, uh, in that, in that Sphinx temple. And it's really interesting also, cause in between I kind of, there's a little alleyway almost between the, the Valley temple and the Sphinx temple. And they'd moved in a bunch of these granite cornice blocks, you yes. know, these curved shapes. There's only a couple of them out the front, but they had a whole stack of them. There's a row of like 10 or 15 of these things shoved up in that area. So, you know, getting to see more examples of that type of stonework was was really cool. Uh, and then just the structure itself is kind of super mysterious. And it's and its connection to the Sphinx and the legends of the Sphinx and what is written about the Sphinx on the, you know, the uh, the, uh, the the dream stele that's between its paws is is really interesting. Yeah. Uh, you know, Yusuf and um, Muhammad were, were talking about, you know, there's an interpretation for it where, it may be so they talk about they show the sphinx on a pedestal on a pedestal yeah right and and y- yusuf thinks that it may actually they may be referring to the cuz you kind of look at it from the front it's almost as if the sphinx could be sitting on top of the or above the the sphinx temple so he you know he thinks they could be representing the sphinx temple as as the um as the pedestal and yeah. the pedestal is supposedly the gateway right uh, that the sphinx is guarding so uh, you know, this could be the gateway to the, you know, the tombs of the gods and and all the rest of it. And he, I have the story recorded from him talking about it. It's an interesting interpretation. And for sure, there's stuff that seems to go into the ground there. That's the other thing. Like there's right, there was a pipe going into the ground, or there was a there's a yeah. hole drilled into the ground in the middle of the temple. Where like if you're standing at the hole in the middle and you look, it's like right there at the like the facing the Sphinx. Or the yeah. Sphinx is looking right at you. And it's kind of, I think, kind of in line with the other hole outside that has the, uh, you, the metal pipe coming out of it. Yeah, so that's what I, I was saying when I was, I was showing this on stream yesterday briefly too. It's That's exactly right. So there is, and I talk about it in one of my videos, but, you know, Zahi Hawass himself in one of his books uh, talks, and you can go to Giza and you stand out the front of that whole area of the Valley Temple, like the cleared off dirt area. Uh, with, which they say was a harbor in ancient times. You know, there's a metal, there's like a concrete block with this, you know, eight inch metal pipe sticking up out of it. Yeah. And it just looks like, what the hell is this? But that's, it's the remnants from where he drilled. Uh, yeah. Was himself, they organized a, a drill and they went down, I think it was between 100 and 150 feet, somewhere around there, and they hit granite. Granite. Uh, and that's where it mm. stopped. So, you know, the, the Giza Plateau being a limestone outcrop there's no natural granite so you know what's granite doing 100 plus feet down into the ground well it's probably been put there and i think i think he even mentions that it was like machined granite, like it was a a worked surface they pulled up chips from what seemed to be a work surface so Mm. certainly indicative that there's something else beneath the ground there and uh we don't know though right and so it was interesting that there was another drill hole inside the sphinx temple uh yeah like they had drilled there as well yeah for stuff and it's it's you know like there's all kinds of the first thing first of all walking around in there versus walking so the other part of that special special permission was that we got to go down into the sphinx enclosure which is a special yep. permission at this point like most people who come to the plateau you can kind of go up and and you can walk along above the sphinx enclosure and look down on it but you can't go down in there so we had a special permission for this tour that allowed us down into the enclosure and alongside that we got to get into the sphinx temple so both of those things yeah. were happening at the same time and it was interesting because going back and forth uh the three of uh ben you and i we went into the sphinx enclosure then we came back out and went into the sphinx temple and then back out again and back into the sphinx enclosure while everybody else went in there because we were you know yeah. shuffling people through and this was the thing that struck me you know just overall was that being in the Sphinx enclosure, while you're obviously next to a very ancient artifact, something that may be in, very ancient, we don't know how old it is, there's so much repair, and you can see, you know, all these different, like from modern through Roman, you know, all the way to dynastic stuff, and you have to look way up high to see the actual parts of the original structure, and even that, it looked like they had been... It looked like somebody had been putting plaster on it to protect it because you could see finger marks like they had been plastering around the Sphinx up there. So really walking around the 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 only original parts of that entire thing are the enclosure walls themselves. And even those have some repairs. So it was it was strange being in there and there's all of this layering more and more modern. And then you go into the Sphinx temple and it's completely different. It's 
I don't know, it was very strange. Like the whole thing felt very ancient, but it also felt almost completely gone. Like most yeah. of what used to be there was totally gone. There weren't even any floor tiles left, you know, like a lot of these structures have big floor tiles, beautiful, sometimes calcite, whatever they've, they've tiled the floor in there. And sometimes that stuff is still there. But in this case, it was down to the bedrock. And there are these big holes and pits next to these big, what look like standing stones. And I don't know, it was just very, it was like standing beneath the, the foundation of the structure itself. And, with, and there, all that's left is a little bit of the walls and some other strange bits and pieces scattered around inside the thing. Yeah, yeah, that's that's right. And it, it's kind of like you say, taken down to the bedrock. And there were so we saw in there one of the things that you notice. This is you see that same combination of stones that you find on old kingdom structures. It's limestone, granite, white calcite, or alabaster. Yeah, the, the crystalline substance, and then you see basalt as well. I'm not sure we saw basalt in there, but you know, in the Valley Temple, you have that white calcite floors, and then there's big blocks of it inside the little alcoves when you walk up to the Sphinx, but in the the Sphinx Temple, yeah, there was there was chunks of white calcite laying around, and then one one giant block of it, a like huge one, huge, yeah, massive, huge, real, like not not a floor tile, like it was, you know, three feet high and yeah, and, whatever know, it was, seven, it would have been a substantial, long. yeah, <laughs> that's right, yeah, big chunk of it, and and it was laying around and uh, heavily eroded, and uh, you know that was the other thing I was looking at my my footage of it yesterday, and. You know, the other feature, you talk about holes going into the ground. So there's this one particular thing that I knew was in there that I really wanted to see, which is a, so there's a granite channeled block that's in there. That's and right. This is Robert Temple talks about this and it's, it's inset in the ground. It's even below the level of the, where the bedrock is. So it would have been below any floor tiles, which is what we see with these channel. I'm fascinated by these U-shaped blocks. It's like a, you know, it's like a, a long, long block with the, this channel that's cut into it. And it's a U-shaped sort of channel and it, you could imagine that it might have held a pipe or of copper or something like that or it's people have theorized that they're for all sorts of different things that you know mainstream kind of looks at them as like sewer drains or septic sewer systems other people think they're for for, for water or some other thing i i really get the sense that it's it's something more and perhaps more industrial than that yeah because we see these at on these old kingdom sites you don't really see them anywhere else and they're beneath the floor level so you know, we see them at Giza. There's at least three blocks. There's that one in the Sphinx Temple. I'll talk about it a bit more in a sec. But there's a, there's another block of it hanging out the back of the Valley Temple, which oh, that's is right. yeah, up actually high. way up high. Yeah, yeah, it's up high. It's really well shaped, and there's a big quartzite block above it, which is that other type of stone you see sometimes. Then you have another block of it up at the other end of the causeway, uh, made of granite, that seems to run into that alabaster block that's in the the Mortuary Temple area of the the Middle Pyramid. And then, you know, we see the same thing at Saqqara. Some of them made from alabaster, some of them made from granite. There's a couple, just a couple fragments of them left out at Dashur lying around. You can see what may have been that infrastructure uh, there as well, obviously evidence for it. And then Abu Sir and Abu Garab have it. And, and Abu Sir has probably the best preserved uh, channel block infrastructure. It's, it's all beneath the floor there. It's... You know, there's Y pipes in it. It runs in all sorts of different directions. It runs beneath the entire causeway, and you can yeah. go right down to the end of the causeway where there's all well, this bush and stuff grown up and uh, over it. You can still find more of the these blocks there. So it's something we see on Old Kingdom sites, and it's beneath these floor levels, and it runs under the causeways, but it doesn't seem to exist in later sites. So it's it to me, it's this fascinating aspect of them that hints at some sort of functional purpose. Now, you know, in the Sphinx Temple, this one block is really interesting because. It's a huge granite piece, and it's it kind of the, the little U-shaped portion of it is 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 inset into the block, and so in in that inset part of it, they've jammed in other granite blocks. Oh, so yeah. it's kind of like it's capped on top. It's capped with these these other pieces of granite. So there's a channel running underneath it, and a couple of observations. So when Robert Temple looked at it, it actually runs into the ground. So so whatever it, there's a hole in the ground in front of it, and it's filled up with mud and debris. Now we don't know how deep that goes. He, he thinks that hole was, the photos I've seen of it, that hole was deeper or, or more excavated. Uh, I think over time with, with the occasional bits of rain and stuff and sand that gets in there, that 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 hole has been filling up. Sure. But it's clearly a, a hole going down into the ground. In fact, Temple thought that these things were used as rope guides to lower boxes and other things into the ground. So it could be an indicator of something, hmm. even if it was for that, which I doubt. I you doubt know, it. You still, I doubt it, yeah. It, but it is it is an indicator that there's something going down into the ground there. And the other thing I noticed looking at the footage was that 
the granite of that block itself is incredibly decomposed. Like it was, it's one of those melted up, like falling uh, apart yeah. granite. And we saw a couple other examples of that in a couple of different places. And what's, you know, this is, you know, we had, we had a, a small brain geologist with us on the trip. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Chuck, just kidding, Chuck. Uh, actually, a, a, gr- a very in- good geologist, practicing geologist, professional geologist with us. And we saw some other examples of this type of just super eroded granite to the point where it's falling apart when you in your hand, like yeah, breaking down into its con- constituent pieces, just super eroded. And these are worked pieces of stone. So this erosion and this deterioration of the granites happened after uh, the surfaces were worked. And we, there's a couple examples we found at Karnak of this and we were looking at it and he, he, you know, Chuck essentially got to the point of saying like, this wouldn't happen within 10,000 years. So he's, yeah. he was, which seems also conservative, but still 10,000 years is way beyond the time frames the standard model talks about. And it could potentially be quite longer, but we, I saw the same thing on that block uh, in this in the Sphinx Temple, it just was chunks of it falling apart. And There's, just uh, just to make it clear, the these pieces that Ben's talking about at Karnak are so decomposing that they look like mud brick when you first look at them. They look like piles of mud. You know, you can't even identify them as granite at first. You have to really look closely, and you're like, oh my god, that's actually granite. It's, it's granite. It it well, it's, yeah. It's, it's it looks like it's just it's just completely falling apart. Yeah, and we saw that something similar in the mountains near the Red Sea. That's right. These granite outcrops that were yeah. ex- have been exposed for who knows how long, but they're just, they're falling apart. In the same way. And yeah. the, the sand, the, what looks like desert sand around them is actually the decomposed granite. Yes. And it's, it's, yeah. been, it's been piling up in sedimentary layers around the granite outcrops. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it looked just like the stuff at Karnak. Right. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> It looks melted. So that's one of the yeah. things it's like, you know, people were thinking like maybe there was some process that was heating these things up and causing that. Well, did it also heat up all the mountains because they look like that? They, yes, that's right. Or is it just really well, freaking old? Yeah. I mean, that, those mountains are clearly the result of, of either age or potentially even taking like a some sort of heat source, like a sun, yeah. a plasma event. Who knows yeah. what? Yeah. But, but yeah, it's really interesting granite there. Yeah, and I mean, and people were, I posted pictures of that. I remember and there were some Twitter armchair experts absolutely convinced it's not granite. Like, this isn't granite. You don't know what you're talking about. Your geologist is full of shit. I'm like, were you there? Like, this is, it's absolutely <laughs> it's granite. It's definitely, definitely granite. granite. It just doesn't. It's 100% granite. But I, it 100% doesn't look like granite, right? That's, so <laughs> no. you can kind of understand. Yeah, it does. <laughs> it looks like granite that's completely destroyed. <laughs> yeah, you get up close to it and I have the film. It's like hard to convey in pictures. But yeah, you, it breaks apart. You see chunks yeah. of mica and quartz and hornblende and, and all those bits that make up granite and you, you clean it off a bit. It's definitely granite. Sure. Yes. Yeah. It looks like granite up close close when you yeah. get it and you sort of start inspecting it but if you're kind of standing off you know 20 or 30 feet you think it's a pile of melting mud brick it's that's what it looks yeah. like yeah but it's not yeah, yeah. So i would like to point out too about this this channel block and the idea that it's a sewer system back to the sphinx temple back to the sphinx temple uh it's really three channels they cut one giant channel into the yep. limestone oh, yeah. bedrock mm-hmm. it is to yeah. fit these blocks in that are mm-hmm. what three or four feet wide, four feet deep. I mean, it's just huge. Yeah, they're huge. Yep. And then long along this, so they cut this four foot wide, four foot d- deep trough into the limestone bedrock. Then they set a granite block in there that filled that trench. Then they cut like a a foot wide and eight inch deep trough into that granite. And then they cut a small four inch wide and maybe three or four inch deep trough in the middle of that. And that trough, yeah. Then they tiled yep. over that small trough <laughs> into the foot wide trough. Yeah. I mean, this is a ridiculous mm. amount of work if you just need shit to flow downhill. <laughs> like that is <laughs> yeah. not what you do for a sewer system. No. So it's it's no. it's really speaks, like you said, to an industrial yeah. process, something that needed to be contained. Yeah. Right. Like, I mean, yeah, or, I, I would think collect- of like even something that was maybe radioactive or something like that, you know, yeah. something that you really wanted to. That's why contain. that granite's falling apart. Potentially. <laughs> yeah. It's radioactive well, damage. It, yeah, well, it's definitely, you. it's either that or it's collected somehow, because remember at Abu Sia, 
yeah, that whole chunk block infrastructure comes out into a quartzite bowl. You have a couple of quartzite blocks of it. Yeah. And, you know, not for nothing. We hunted around no, and no. we found the entrance to that, like what seemed to yeah. be the entrance to that system. Yeah. And it's pointing right at the pyramid. Like it literally looks like it could have it could have originally gone into. Yes, the pyramid. that's right. Um, now there's a there's the the channel in the uh, the causeway is in into limestone, so it seems, you know, we, like uh, the blocks, the channel blocks are in the causeway at Abyssir. Yep, limestone. It's limestone. It's yeah, you get a mix. There's some of them are limestone, some of them are quartzite, but in the causeway they're mostly limestone. And underneath the floor of uh, that that courtyard, the <laughs> Nusara courtyard is is <laughs> the watcher. Yeah, watcher. It was it's, flowing it's mercury. mercury bro. Of course, of course it's flowing mercury. Flowing mercury. Of course yeah. it's flowing mercury. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's what it is. I see it. Yeah, I see right. radioactive, solved. radioactive mercury. That's what it was, folks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean it. 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 It runs. Uh, it does run into, um, you know, you, it's they're Y shaped too. Like they just, it goes everywhere, and it's yeah, all limestone yeah, yeah. underneath that courtyard, and it's just a real mystery. I, you know, I don't know. And there it's was definitely. I definitely don't think it's a septic system. No. Well, this is the thing, and so we'll we're going to get Chuck on the small brain geologist. We're going to have him on the show, uh, <laughs> and probably Marty to talk He's about a this freaking too. back of the busser. <laughs> Both of them. He, he is. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, my friends, it was great. The you know all around that site at Abu Sir, uh, there were bits of really rough looking pottery, and Chuck said he was just like these look like uh, these look like molds to me. What did he call them? Crucibles. Yeah, crucibles. Yeah. You know, the metal pours in. It's a one time use, so you don't have to make it super awesome, and you just break it when the metal cools and get the stuff out of there. So there's this shattered pottery, thick, rough. Mm -hmm stuff all over the place and then chuck actually took a piece of it and went over and spoke to the he spoke to someone there on the site to hassanin was Maybe. it hassanin or he spoke i thought he said he was trying to talk to the one of the people at the site oh Maybe. and he just he came back and said yeah they said that their idea now is that they were doing some kind of metallurgy there ah, so that's interesting. that may not be in the in the mainstream yet but chuck talked to some people there and they said yes it looks like metallurgy to them too well, yeah, Yusuf thinks also that those those quartzite bowls uh, at Abu Ghraib with those, you know, those tubes oh, yes. coming, the, the holes cut in and it may have been connected up. Yeah. Because there's evidence that they were they had copper lining, like there may have been copper pipes in them and, and may have been plated in copper on the inside. So, mm. you know, maybe these channels held copper pipes or something like that yeah. uh, originally. I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those mysteries. It's just like kind of gets dismissed as like, well, it's a septic system. Sewer system. Yeah, because yeah. the because the for all the people living at the temple, the mummy apparently. had to take a dump. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Right. The tomb. It's a septic it. system for the tomb. Yeah, folks. we need to make these. <laughs> it's definitely we need to make these resolved. out of granite and quartzite. Yeah. Because at Saqqara, they're out of, they're made out of quartzite and granite as well. Like there's some, and the ones at Saqqara, you maybe we brushed off the side of them, and they're like amazingly well machined, like these crazy yeah. flat surfaces and those straight cuts. So it seems to be built with, quote unquote, pyramid builder tech. Yeah. Uh, some Soul. of these blocks, so soul dumps. You know, I... <laughs> soul dumps. when you got to go take a kef. <laughs> <laughs> Are you taking a kef or a ka? Kef yeah, just a, a kef this time. <laughs> <laughs> you go number two. You always go number one. <laughs> what time we got? Where are we at? Um, I don't know. Okay. We're, almost there. We're getting close. So yeah, yeah I, I I I want to stress again that the the pyramid complex is mm. just I mean it just it stands out so much more clearly even the you know like the second time it's like people I mean you you want to look at the pyramid and go inside and try to figure out well what is this thing all about but there is so much going on on the outside yeah of these yeah. things that seems to be connected to what's going on on the inside in some way. And uh, everywhere you go where there's a pyramid, there is a bunch of this weird stuff on the outside. And, of course, a lot of it had been quarried away and taken away, but there are traces of these systems around the outside that just don't make sense for a tr the traditional, you know, this is a, a burial site idea. That's right. Yeah. Well, and it... You know, it adds to the overall building project too. Like that's, I had these really nice pictures I saw of where the, we parked a bus and we were looking at the 
the middle pyramid from that corner, and it's like that the low corner. I think it's the east uh, northeast corner, and just the layers of bedrock that the had they had to construct to create the foundation platform for that pyramid. Yeah, you remember oh we God. parked yeah. the bus there, and, massive, and we went massive blocks just stacked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's this huge foundation that they had yes. to make first. It's like you know, it's ten feet tall, and in that corner, and, and you know, they had to level that all up before they could even start building the pyramid, and then. You got the pyramid, you've got the causeway, you've got the mortuary temple, you've got the valley temple. Yeah, all this infrastructure. It's just an astonishing amount. And all of this plays back, to, you know, this this is the, the question we keep coming back to when we look at these sites. I know on the site, it's it's the question about the erosion. You know, the Sphinx plays into this, but not just the Sphinx, but the tremendous erosion that you see uh, on structures like the, what they'd call the mortuary temple, a pyramid temple up, up at the end of the causeway in front of the, yeah. of the pyramid. You know, these... And giant limestone blocks. I mean, we found, I think we were with you guys last year and we found the biggest one that we found is like 380 tons or something crazy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that huge block that's part of that mortuary temple structure and just the erosion is severe. And and I was making this point recently too. And um, it's one I'm going to keep coming back to is because this is supposedly old kingdom. So say it's all fourth dynasty. You, we also have a ton of other old kingdom masonry work, like the small blocks, you know, these, these tombs and structures all yeah. around the causeway, both sides of it. You know, the, the tombs of the nobles and the, 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 all the, the high priests and everybody else that's associated with the dynasty made in the same time, supposedly by the same people, and none of that shows the same type of erosion. That's you know, right. It's these small limestone blocks and they're it's still standing, wow. you know, it's not like they weren't earthquake proof or something. But you just don't see the same degree of erosion on that work that supposedly comes from the same time period that you do from this this stuff that's that's sitting there and it's just literally blocks have fallen off from other blocks because erosion has affected the lower block so much that it's toppled over. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's 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 a it's a real open question I think about the erosion and of course yeah. there's you know we could talk for days about the erosion on the Sphinx you you mentioned it earlier but. Um, yeah, let's. Yeah. We can get into that, but let's uh, let's take a quick break. Yep. We're up on Roger time. that. And uh, yeah, we'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, is a jam session on the beach at the Red Sea with uh, Ben, Russ, and Yusuf and myself. Yusuf and I drove, I don't know, an hour and 15 minutes total, probably, or more, <laughs> to uh, some marketplace far away and went walking all around looking for a shop that sold musical instruments. And the, we finally found one. And the guy had this giant pile of flutes which is what we were looking for. <laughs> but they were like cheap knockoffs made, you know, yeah. just like somebody that doesn't, is not a musician, just drilling these flutes. And youth is like picking them up and he's going through them all, going through them all. And he's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> he picks it up, holds it, looks at it, puts it down, picks the next one up. And I'm like, what are you looking for? And he's like, it must have seven sections <laughs> on the bamboo. <laughs> <laughs> it's not right. And so then eventually it came down to none of them were right. And so then he starts playing through everyone to see uh, if any of them are tuned properly. Tuned and properly. they were just not. <laughs> the guy just and drilled so I, random holes. Yeah. So I go over there, grab a guitar off the guy's rack and like tune it up. And then I start, you know, playing the scales with him along with the flute to see if it, and it's just like, nope, throw that one aside. <laughs> Man, we were there for like 30 or 45 minutes while he went through all these flutes. <laughs> and he eventually found this tiny little one that was like the best of all of them, and it was still terrible. Yeah. And he brings it back <laughs> and, like, soaks it in time. oil. Yeah. He goes to the fish yeah. the fish restaurant, and he's like, I need some oil. <laughs> give him oil. <laughs> soaks the thing in the oil, and then and then we jammed, and it was beautiful. Uh, that was awesome. And, it uh, was. Yeah. <laughs> it was just funny, because it was like, 
he said it was the most expensive flute he had ever bought because we had to pay for the taxi all the way over there. <laughs> <laughs> and the crappiest one he'd ever bought too. But it was totally worth it because yeah. we got to jam. So this is telling me the call ends in 10 minutes. Oh, yeah. We didn't do the reset call. Well, of course. Yeah. Of course we forgot to do that. Another pro move. Yeah. yeah. That's all right. We're professionals. We can fix the call right now with zero edits. Bam. Done. All right. So we're going to, are we going to talk about the erosion on the Sphinx? Yes. Enclosure? This is also the first time we've ever been down into the Sphinx enclosure. We didn't go last year. Right. Uh, ben, I'm sure you've been down there. Yeah, I went there in 2015. It was I've been I was looking forward to this as well because yeah, that was my first trip to Egypt when I went down in there, and I had learned a bit since then. So I was keen so to get back. So first question: Did you did you notice differences from your trip in 2015? Yeah, I mean, I observed a lot, a lot more. Uh, I was honestly paying probably more attention to the the Sphinx Temple than the Sphinx itself. But I did take the chance to kind of walk all around it, and I think you mentioned it earlier. It, and that's you know, it's very. That's why the the argument about the erosion of that whole structure sort of ends up being focused on the walls of the enclosure because there's been so much work done to the body of the Sphinx itself. Yeah, and looking at the Sphinx, I know, you know, you see repairs from dynastic egyptian times potentially even old kingdom egyptian times there is yeah you know famously the inventory stele talks about kafre repairing the sphinx and not making it kind of gets dismissed by uh the mainstream uh egyptology but you see repairs from roman times and modern times and then looking at it i also you know i know what's been done in modern times now like you know there's a whole collar around the neck like like if you go back and look yeah. at the old you know, early photographs of the Sphinx, it's next much more narrow and the headdress isn't supported. So they added all this support uh, underneath the headdress uh, that's on the neck of it. And you, and as you said, there's probably been plaster added to the body of it in places where it is just bedrock. Yep. So it's tough to say what is and isn't uh, original bedrock there when you're looking at it. But, you know, even the parts that some of it on the body, it does look pretty heavily eroded uh, as as opposed to the the head of it which i've always found to be a you know a giant contradiction uh, yes. particularly when you combine it with the explanation that is used uh, by the standard model to tell you well you know the walls of the enclosure and the body of the sphinx it's all wind and sand erosion right that's the yeah that's the explanation and i've always found that to be rather confusing because if you give that sphinx you know what 20 30 years maybe even less, it's going to fill up with sand. Like the enclosure fills up with sand. Right. And and you can see tons of photos of this uh, back in the early days before it was cleared out for modern tourism where it's, you know, it's more or less up to its shoulders and neck in sand. So, okay, how, how do you, you know, how do you do wind and sand erosion when it's probably for centuries, if not millennia, been filled up with sand? That's one point. And then the other thing I always find confusing is that the, it, the one part of the Sphinx that is out of the wind that is definitely going to be subject to wind and sand erosion its head and its face that doesn't show the same erosion it doesn't show really much erosion at all like it's pretty yeah. good yes for what it is that's the that's the part of it and you know i know people say well you know that part of the limestone is a much harder part of the limestone than the other layers of limestone but still which is part I of mean, the reason why it's was a yarding to begin with that's why it was sticking yeah. up yeah. yeah, there's a definite exactly. change in rock texture from the neck and shoulders up to the head. Uh, yeah, for sure. The rock is still, the head is darker, yeah. much darker stone. I don't know. You don't have to it climb is. up there and look at it, but it's so. But obviously, if there was, if it was protruding above as a natural feature, then that rock was hard. But still, like you're right, the the heavy erosion on the body doesn't match the erosion on the head, and that doesn't make any sense. No. Yeah. Nor the walls of the enclosure. And to me, it's just like you, you've got to like account for like thousands of years potentially that it's been buried, like parts of it, have, at least the yeah. enclosure. Right. So, you know, you, the head has to, and given if you go with your son, let's say it was all carved around the same time, that's thousands of years more of wind and sand erosion that the head, even if it's harder stone, yeah. has suffered. And it just doesn't seem like it's suffering that type of erosion. And it's, again, we, we see that type of super heavy erosion, not just in the enclosure, but on other structures, you know, the older megalithic structures around around the whole plateau as well. Yeah. 
So I, I just think it all points to this idea that yeah, was the was the head recarved at some point? I think pretty obviously yes. It's you know there's the other aspect of it being out of proportion. The Egyptians were clearly masters of proportion. Yep. Uh, the statues that they made and the stuff that is 100% dynastic. I mean, they were master craftsmen and artisans. Uh, they wouldn't have got that proportionality so so off with the Sphinx. It's just it doesn't look right uh, with right. the size of the head. So. Yeah, I mean, yeah, even I the it, even the stripes on the headdress are still clearly visible. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Which you know, that's that's a small feature that would be eroded if it was just as old as the enclosure. If the carving of the yeah. head was just as old as the enclosure. Yeah, yeah. If it, if it had suffered the same degree of erosion, it's just like again, yeah, and it's just these enclosures. Like, that stuff fills up with sand pretty quick. I mean, I, I we were. You know, we were walking around areas of it. Maybe this was in October when I was there, but you guys have seen it too. I've probably seen photos of it. And I can show you. It's like even from twenty years ago, twenty thirty years ago, the archaeological work happening around the plateau. There's there's doors, and they put iron doors in on all of these little tombs that are cut into what was potentially a quarry areas off to the side of the causeway. And you go over there now, and the doors are like literally. There's two feet of the door still sticking up out of the sand. It's just filled up with sand. Right. Um, I can, and personally, I can tell you, like when we got into those uh, catacombs at Saqqara, when I was last in there in 2016, so what, you know, five, six years ago, I mean, you used to be able to go a lot further into that, into that complex, and it's just filled up with sand. Like it's just these, you know, th this this environment changes rapidly in the desert, and stuff fills up with sand. So it's just, it d wouldn't take long for that enclosure area to get to get buried without sort of constant maintenance, uh, and then. Yeah, it was really cool. Like seeing stuff, we saw those fossil layers, uh, some really cool fossil examples. Yes, uh, in the limestone, which is not indication of anything other than yeah, it's limestone. Um, but just seeing that stuff was was really cool. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a it's a real privilege to get in and and stand in that whole enclosure, particularly particularly on the day that we had that we chose to go do all those. Oh my god! Yeah, it was, it was it was a zoo. It, it was, was an absolute zoo. Man, yeah. Egypt. <laughs> Egyptian weekend and I mean there were thousands of people it took us I mean it took us god what an hour to we went through the gates in the bus and just to get around that loop in the parking lot of the where the yeah. ticket area was took forever and then to drive over to the sphinx must have been an hour just yeah. because of the traffic and the people yep um so it, was, it felt really cool and uh and kind of special to be like you know, shepherded through and then dropped into the, the enclosure area where no one else could go. People yeah. are trying to get in the gate, like, oh, can we come in? Like, no, you can't come in. Yeah. <laughs> this is special permission. Yeah. <laughs> get out of here. And then one guy jumped yeah. the fence and climbed down in there while we were in there. Yeah. He did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I'll just, I'll just, I'll just blend in. No right. He's gonna, I'm going to blend in. <laughs> <laughs> nope. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, it was cool. But yeah. So yeah, that whole, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I was going to say back to the uh, back to the Sphinx Temple again because I brought this up at the beginning. The so when you're standing in the middle, the the main open area. I don't know what you would call it. The the main courtyard area of it. Yeah. There are what eight, maybe ten of these. How many were there? This big. They look like standing stones next to deep pits. About that many. Yeah. Yeah. Four on each side or something like that. Mm. Such a strange. I, I stood in the middle there just looking at those things, wondering what what is this? What I couldn't, you know, and I'm I'm also imagining in my mind, like, okay, other temples, even just the, the valley temple across the way, like this doesn't make any sense. It doesn't look anything like no. this. And and, and in, in some cases it actually looked like and I know this didn't work for all of them, but it looked like those stones used to lay down in those pits. Like they were kind of the same shape. Yeah, it was just weird. Like they had been stood up, like they used to be down in there. I don't know. It was it was just a, it's just just a strange sight, you know. The whole the whole effect of it walking around in there. You're just like, what is this for? Yeah. Of course, which is something you do with pyramids, walking in the pyramids and some of the other temples, the Osirian, as well. But I don't know. This one really struck me as as very odd. It didn't even. I don't know. It didn't have the same kind of feel as the other temples did. The, mm. the well, Valley Temple. I feel like 
like you had mentioned before, that because the tile flooring was gone, yeah, we're seeing the substructure. The substructure, yeah. And it's very odd. Mm. Like, why did they did they did they dig down and make these these deep square pits because they were setting giant granite columns there? Yeah, or something like. It, they Some they of them were sloped. them in. You yeah. know, I mean, the there bottoms were, of them were strange. Yeah, uh, and then there were big nubs. Yeah. Ben and I counted at least five, yeah. maybe six nubs sticking up out of the floor. Out of the bedrock. Out yeah. of the bedrock. The bedrock yeah. Yeah. Heavily, yeah. heavily yep. eroded, so they were, you know, but they were clearly... But you could sock it a, yeah. a tile in. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's, it's, yeah. So, yeah, it's just... It was very strange, and you know, you know, watch your feet like you're walking around with a video camera, and then you're like, "Whoa, there's a <laughs> yeah, giant there's, hole right there's there." There's a giant hole, and then and then there's a big nub sticking out. Nub, yeah, yeah. I get the same sense. It, it does look like those blocks would fold down. It almost, yeah, they're right in front. It's like you imagine they're lined up. There's these standing stones of limestone, and it's it, they have these pits in front of them that seem to match their shape as if. Yeah, that would fold. You just have this imagination of like, well, they fold down and the whole thing opens up. That's whatever. right. That's yeah, what I'm yeah. saying. You, if it was a video game, game, you clearly <laughs> you yeah, would yeah, Creed, over. it would open up. That's like, right. Exactly. <laughs> Let's work on this. See what happens. That's yeah, too yeah, easy, yeah. guys. Come on. That's it's too yeah. easy. It's too easy to solve that yeah, puzzle. Knock, uh, <laughs> knock over the four-ton stone. See what you have to. You have. There's Get some kind of. There's some kind of. Like symmetry to the to the design. Like they have they have a pit. And then they have a column next to the pit that's the same shape and roughly dimensions as the pit. Mm. But I, I mean, I know that others had mentioned that it looked like they would fold down in, but I'm just thinking like, really, you're going to, you know, fold the rocks the in and out stone. of the holes. I don't, I just, I don't know that this doesn't yeah. make sense to me. It just looks like some kind of symmetry that they're, that they're, shooting for or going for with the with the way the substructure is supposed to hold the vertical columns yeah i don't know yeah. I, there's you definitely know, symmetry don't know the answer but yeah there's I, definitely symmetry even in the dog leg like the chambers towards the front of the sphinx side they were mirrored you know yes, that like yeah. those dog legs on each side the left and the right were the same and the, some of the wall had fallen down on the further one yep uh, so it doesn't look like that but those those dog leg sort of chambers that don't go anywhere. They, they were the same on both sides. That's right. Yeah. They acted like yeah. big sort of maybe pinchers that were going around the, the central area. Yeah. yeah. It was yeah, yeah, exactly. such a strange structure. And then, of course, there's the possibility that it was two floors. You know, if the Valley Temple right. also had a second floor, maybe this one did as well. Potentially. So yeah. we're just, you know, we're uh, once again, we're looking at the substructure below the basement, uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> something like that. It's... Well, I think it was cased in granite. It seems like there's evidence. There's granite, lots of granite blocks around it. Then you have all those cornice blocks as well that yeah. it may well have been uh, originally cased in granite. There are chunks of granite laying around us. Yep. And there, there were some granite blocks still in place, and you could see the exact same, you know, round the corner kind of style of of block making with the what looks like that constant radius yes. hole that's been drilled down to mark the corner yep. to and cut those blocks in to, to the corner. Like that, We saw that, even though it's not... In the Valley Temple, it's nice because they're still stacked up really high. But you got like maybe two, two, two courses of stones in a couple spots in the in the Sphinx Temple that you can see exactly the same thing. So it seems like the same methodology. But yeah, a lot more bedrock uh, work going on in that one. I, I don't know. Yeah, it's it's a it's it's a hole I want to dive into and dig into and do a bunch of research on and try and see what people have said about it over the over the years and. Yeah, you're planning on produce, like making a produced video about the Sphinx. Temple, oh, for right? sure, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, no, I I want to share this with people. It's it's a, yeah, no one's seen. I mean, I posted some pictures of it online. And we before the trip, we we ran into a Hugh Newman and JJ. Ainsworth. That's right. They yeah, were, um, they just finished a tour and then they were, we kind of had an overlap. So one of the days before the tour was, you know, us three and then Hugh and JJ and Yusuf and we went out and went to Saqqara for the day. It was great getting to meet Hugh. And chat with him, but I remember posting up pictures after the trip about the Sphinx Temple, and he one of the comments on Instagram. He was like, "Holy crap, you know? Yeah, <laughs> tell me, you tell me, you filmed the hell out of this. You're going to make a video." I'm like, "Yeah, I will, of course, of course." But because it's a lot of people have been wanting to get into that space and take a closer look for a long time. People that know about the the plateau and the details of it, it's like that's that's always been a really mysterious area that very few people have seen, and certainly nobody seems to have documented really well that you yeah. can go and look at. Well, I hope video, we can so get really access to it that again because otherwise we had the chance to do that. 
It's going to take me 120 years to scan the whole thing. I only got a third of it. <laughs> I'll see what we can if do. It's going to take another 60 years before we can get back in there. I'm screwed, <laughs> guys. Yes. Well, you know, that's not the only place we started. That was kind of the end of the trip. That was the last day we did all those special permissions and the Great Pyramid. But we also started there at the, the start of the trip, right? We uh, we uh, were at Giza, and the very first thing we threw people at was the um, – the Osiris shaft, and this is one of the mystery solved things that I wanted to to get to. Ah. You remember we uh, we went down into the Osiris shaft, which is like you're three levels down. It's it's one of these other special permissions. You got to climb down these rickety ladders quite a ways uh, into the into these chambers beneath the causeway. And there's a couple of boxes, actually three boxes down there. Uh, two on the middle level and one on the bottom level that's now all underwater. You can't see a damn thing down there anymore, but. But there's always been this mystery surrounding the Dacite box that seems to have this black ooze. Oh, no. you This not. goo. Huh? Oh, I know this mystery. <laughs> yeah, been... This mystery, right? Yeah. Did I solve this mystery? You did. I think you did. <laughs> Carl God, solved the mystery. <laughs> My favorite shirt. <laughs> what? <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Well, so there's been a lot of you know, speculation over the years about, about this black goo. And I mean, Brian Forrester managed to get a bit of it and have it tested. And he came back with like a bitumen or oil based substance and, uh, and turns and, and we, you know, if you look at some of the earlier videos and I, Russ, you made this joke and it's just, and I've been telling people that for years too. It's like, somebody needs to like lick, lick this for science. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty grotty. Like it, it, down there, it's like, you know, that's, this yes. is gnarly weird looking stuff that's in this box this and all over you gotta lick it for science right Charles and of course <laughs> that's right and, and of, of course chuck the geologist actually did yeah because oh, no. he's a geologist and the geologists geologist. use the taste test this they is a thing the they do. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah and uh and so it's always this wondering like what is this black goo what's this what's this substance on this box and uh you know you look around in that middle level in these alcoves and over in the corner one of the alcoves is this you know, this old ass water pump, this big sort of wheel driven water pump, belt driven thing that obviously I think must have been there since like the eighties or nineties, whenever Hawass had, had pumped the water out so he could go down there and film. Yeah. And uh yeah, Kyle, you uh were climbing around in there and you know, you kind of eventually made the comparison, right? Yeah, yeah. I yeah, I was checking out the <clears throat> I climbed up on the box first and then I was just like looking at this stuff. I'm like, what is the deal with this? And I was checking it out, got it on my hands, got it on my shirt, <laughs> right in the front. Mm -hmm. And first uh, day. Yeah, first day. And then I went over to the uh, pump and I was like checking it out. And it has a little, like a reservoir or whatever on it. And there's just that same stuff is all over it. Mm. Yeah. And so my thought was, oh, okay, like this is this pump requires oil of course and they probably had jugs of oil in here because the pump leaked obviously it's all over the pump mm -hmm. which is what happens when you got a spinning wheel and a leaking oil it just goes everywhere it gets all over everything yeah. so they were probably storing jugs of this whatever oil that was used in, in that this box. pump in the box uh -huh. or on top of the lid and i can tell Spilling you it everywhere. yeah well <clears throat> you know you're using big jugs of oil and then you're setting them on the ground and there's rocks and all this stuff and you get a little pinhole in one of those. Oh, yeah. yeah. It just leaks out all over the top of the box where you have the oil sitting. So it's all over. It ran over the lid. It runs down the side of the box. It goes inside the box. It's mm. puddled up in there mm. and it's all over the pump. Okay. Yeah. It's the same stuff and it's on my shirt <laughs> and I still have that shirt. So I could get it tested again. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that's, I, I think it's a great explanation. I think that's a good explanation. Like they were using that damn thing as an, as an oil reservoir or a place to store the oil. And yep. just the way that. Yeah. I thought for a minute that maybe they had the pump in the box. Like, but then mm. that didn't make sense. I was like, nah, they probably, that's when I started thinking they were just had jugs of oil down there sitting on top of that box. Yeah. Yeah. And they were leaking. Yeah. This is, so I don't want to, go too far away from this conversation, but this is also what I started to think about uh, the Serapian boxes because there's evidence in there and we saw this that, you know, they, they, they're putting those, um, they're, they're supporting the ceilings, they're putting those big uh, 
metal framework into the alcoves and then they were spraying yep. foam insulation and other glues and caulks and stuff mm -hmm. up there and sometimes that stuff dripped down onto the boxes and ran down the sides well uh, yeah there's in fact they had these resin pads like I don't yeah. know if you've seen a couple of places like that that metal framework that they've stuck in there is braced against the walls by these big bags full of some sort of resin and it's it's dripping out like yeah. this and right. that's not to say it's the same thing as the liquid polish thing, which is a whole other topic. But there's definitely like residue and some stuff on the boxes. And I think it's coming from these resin pads. I actually saw it. Right? For the first time, I actually noticed one of these big bags and it's like leaking this resin stuff. Yeah. Uh, that's coming down and hitting the box. But yeah, I, I, uh, it's specifically the black goo um, in the, in the, in the Asara shaft. I think we may have hit on the All right, mystery like solve. explanation yeah, for yeah. it too. Yeah. Mystery yeah. solve, bro. That's, yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, 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 I missed that entire day. I didn't so. realize that was a... Okay. Yeah, well, that's cool. Yeah, you did. You had a heart attack. And yeah. Had, a, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> had a medical emergency with that's somebody right. else on the trip. That's right. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I think... And, I mean, it matches with Brian Forrester's testing and say it's like a bitumen or something, which is like an oil-based, yeah. you know. I mean, that's the same same base for that material. So Yeah. Cool. Uh, anyway, right. interesting. Yeah. Lost a shirt, solved a mystery. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Fair trade. I guess. Fair trade. <laughs> <laughs> I asked the guy in the hotel when I did my laundry, I was like, you think you can get this oil stain out of this shirt? And he was just like, mm, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but yeah, if we, if you're talking about the Serapium, that's, <clears throat> that's mm -hmm. a major topic for me. Um, yep. We got to go in twice this time. Uh, we did. We yeah. went early. On the trip to Saqqara early before the tour started with uh, with Hugh Newman and uh, and Yusuf, so that was great. We got to we got to kind of run around in there a bit um, and do some investigation. And then we went back with the tour, and this was one of the special permissions, right? Mm -hmm. We got the you guys got the uh, the back room opened, the part that's normally yep. closed with the big discarded box that's shoved off in the corner. Yeah, yep, that was another little surprise. We. Pulled for them, and it's a place I've been trying to get back to since I was first in there in 2016. So I was again really happy to make it happen. Uh, to make it happen, um, yeah, really cool. And it's, yeah, it's therapy. I want to talk about that too because you know, it, as usual with all these investigations into it, kind of the, the thinking evolves a bit. And uh, we even uh, we even managed to do some science, which is cool. We did. We did mm. to do some science. Mm. Kyle awesome. actually did quite a bit of science. Really. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear about the science y'all did. You know? <laughs> I was definitely in my own world down in there. Well, I yeah. I had a uh, a microscope, a USB microscope that was given to me by an undisclosed source, <laughs> and oh. uh, it connects to the phone, which is very useful. It had its own internal light, so I took a lot of high magnification images of outsides and insides of box surfaces that we're going to get uh, hopefully we'll get them analyzed properly uh, but the point was is to look for tool marks that could be matched up against known types of tool marks uh, stuff that you can't see yep. with a naked eye this microscope was capable of 40x and 1000x magnification so I got images mm -hmm. in both uh, I took some of the Areas where the pooling is supposed to have happened with the polish looking liquid, mm -hmm. uh, where you can kind of see the demarcation between the polished area or the liquid covered area and then and the area that doesn't have it on there. Uh, I took some images of the chisel marks where mark where the polished surface has been cut through, uh, probably by later people chiseling glyphs into it, so you can see the clear like there's almost a. It's hard to tell, you know, just looking at the images, but it looks like they were breaking through a, um, well, I don't know if I should say, it. it looks like this. I don't know if this is actually what it is, but it looks like the chisel broke through a, a, a surface that has a thickness. Yep. Um, yeah. With the microscope, which is very interesting. But again, that's just what it looks like. Me looking at the photos that were taken on my phone, I, I'm, again, we're going to get them properly analyzed, hopefully. Uh, and yeah. then, yeah, and then uh, did get to, there was a lot of people in there, so we did get to get inside of a lot more boxes. Kyle made a proper map, right? Yeah, that was the first day when we went with uh, Hugh Newman. 
I uh, went through and took photographs of each box, and while making a note and drawing a map on my... I mean, I know a map is available online, but to connect each alcove each. to a photograph yeah. of the box yep. and with a couple of short descriptive things about the box to say, okay, this is this box and that's where it is, is important yep. because really it's... it's even though it's kind of a simple, it's a difficult cave system. It's like it's yeah. yeah. You don't know where you are, and you come out like if you're in an alcove, and then you come out. And you're like, wait, which way was I going? And yep. it, very yeah. often I would turn and start going the way, and it's like, no, no, no. This is the way I came. There's the box with the yeah. with the inclusion in it right there. Okay, I got to go the other way. It's kind of it's a huge place. Yeah, even yeah. Though the map it's is very simple, large, it's it massive, is. and the boxes are enormous, and just it, it's very confusing. So how yeah, you you lose track. So yeah, it's yeah. nice. It's really cool to correlate like specific boxes to specific locations, and yeah, that's that yeah. that is definitely needed. Yeah. Yeah. So I did that on the first day, and um, got to get in a few boxes, and um, you know, photograph the interior, or take some video of the interior, and tone in there and figure out what the resonant frequencies were. And then when we went back, I think I, on the first day I got in three, three, or two, two or three. Yeah. Uh, like I that. know. And from the first trip, I know a few of the boxes that I got into, but the other ones, I don't know which ones they were. That right. was the problem. Yeah. So it was like, how am I supposed to know which ones I haven't been in yet? Yeah. Right. So, uh, I still have to f try to figure out, which ones I got in the first time, but I mm. I know now from this trip that I got in. Uh, you got in seven. I got in eight. nine boxes because I got in two the first time. Okay, and then I got in seven, seven the second time. The second time, okay. and I got yeah. in five last year. Just don't know which five. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So that was really cool, and I so I I now have a way of knowing which is which, and the, some of the ones I got into were very interesting and I guess we can talk about that when we come back oh yeah we take, uh, need to take a break, break. Yeah. let's do that right and we'll be right back with more of the Serapium Listening to another Red Sea jam and Charmel Chic. Funk on the Red Sea. Oh Funk boy. on the Red Sea. What did we decide? This was uh, this was this was like Texas, Australia, Egypt, <laughs> uh, desert outback uh, rock. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> blues band. Uh, blues band. That's right. Was it blues? Something yeah. Like desert outback blues. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> So kids going um, crazy in the background. It's yeah, crazy. yeah, kids going nuts. The beach was crowded. It was, and we were just out there jamming. It was so much fun, yeah. and a great, a great, you know, relaxation after the tour. We spent uh, oh. with five days with Yusuf and Sharm El Sheikh. We went to some museums. We looked at some other stuff, but mostly we chilled on the beach and we really got caught some up on sleep. Yeah, caught up on sleep, got some downtime, but also really got to bond. The four of us hanging out, talking, <laughs> chilling. No responsibilities yeah. except to, you know, find lunch. When is lunch? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> lunch time? Yeah. Lunch Yusuf time? tried to kill us with really good food. I mean. He did. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> when I finished dinner, he's like, when is breakfast? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What is breakfast? And it, uh, I can't even think about on, food man. right now. And then yeah. we'd go to places and he'd order the biggest thing that they had. We oh, went to the I seafood restaurant. I'm, he's like, there's this giant fish on display. He's like, I want that fish. <laughs> He's like, that is ours. Yeah. That is ours. And then they cooked it and brought it to the table in this massive fish. I love the style, <laughs> dude. So he just great. like yeah. orders everything for it. Like we just Biggest. we sit down and he's already he's already talked to the chef. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He doesn't want to talk to the waiters. He goes straight to the chef. <laughs> chef. Yeah. And he's like, he is my cousin. Yeah, crosses his palm. And <laughs> right. Dude, he just yeah, he had that place on lockdown. It just he did. Watching him work was Yeah. It's amazing. Like if you watch Yusuf when he's uh, when he's rolling around geezer, I mean he just greases the skids everywhere you go. Yeah, 
And by, by by what I mean is you're paying people. Like this is that's the culture there. But he, I didn't realize it also extended to like this the vacation part. And he <laughs> yeah, just, yeah. I mean, we had the best part on the beach. Yep. We had these waiters who were always at us. What do you guys want? Cappuccino, 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 yeah, red yeah. bull, red bull, beer, beer, <laughs> and and you know food. You want some shish kawook? What do you want? And yeah. Uh, yeah, and then yeah, he like literally hits up the chef, and you get the good reservation. Like, yeah, it was yep. amazing. Yeah, yeah, it was all. And uh, Mo also hooked it up. Like, we get there, and it's dude, like Mo. all inclusive. You know, basically, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's like I asked the lady at the desk. I was just like, wait a minute, beers. are you talking about beers and wine? She was like, yes, yeah. it's all inclusive. I was like, you might want to change your policy. Yeah, you might that, need uh, to change your policy. <laughs> <laughs> you guys may be rethinking that policy after I leave this I, place. This policy no longer applies to people from Texas. <laughs> <laughs> I try to make sure that all they the Australians consider that policy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. God, I did my I'm, best, I'm folks. Legitim- <laughs> I'm legitimately thinking like that's an ex- that's an ex- optional extension you put yes. on the tour. Oh, it's like it's yeah. got to be. Come on down. I mean, not like, like we're not like all gathering together and hanging out all day. Like it's just like we get three or four, whatever it is. Yeah, a few days, all inclusive. Hang out here, do what you want. Like that's just part right. of the deal. We went and snorkeling. Then, There's a reef. It was beautiful. Oh, Fantastic. Dude. Yeah, yeah. It was. I was all antsy about it because I was like, uh, I just got. It, for me, it was the back end of three months of travel. We did the right two scabland trips. I then I had two nights at home. I went to Egypt in October. I came back. I was supposed to go to. Um, Sedona uh, for a conference that got canceled, but then you know, like I had two weeks, and then I was back in Egypt again for this trip. So I was kind of going in, going, "Damn it, you know, why did I, why did I book this extra week? I'm not going to want to, not going to want to do it." And then it's coming up, and I'm kind of harassing Yusuf. I'm like, "You know, look, what are we going to do? Like, are we going to go to Dahab? We're going to go to Alexandria? We're going to go do this and see that and do this?" And he's like, "No, we chill out on the beach." And we went, and we did go to the museum, which is in Sham, which is definitely worth doing. Oh yeah, beautiful. We also did a quad ride. At the, we rode quads out in the desert, which was really cool. The mountains and stuff. Yeah. But uh, I tell you what, I wasn't unhappy when we just those days on the beach. That's the perfect way to end that sort of thing. Just yeah, chill out, relax. Yeah, and, everything and, included. Waited on hand and foot. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> snorkeling on the reef. <laughs> yeah, it was. Jamming magic. on the beach. Yeah, like, yeah. You're just pampered. I, yeah. It was like, I, yeah. I could have spent a few more days there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Would not have been a hardship. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. That first dinner that we had, though, was hilarious. Oh, my God. Oh. Yeah, because everything was closed when we got there, and they, and they were like, well, there's this one restaurant that's out in the mall. Yeah. That's part but, of the uh, all-inclusive yeah, thing. Yeah, it's part of the all-inclusive Part story. of the deal. Yeah. So we go there, and Yusuf just, like, orders everything. <laughs> you know, here we go. Beers, freaking, like, wine, wine like, yeah, all wine. the food. Like, go. And then the guy the guy is just like, wait a minute. Uh, you're paying. And he's just like, no. We're, we're, not, we're not paying. <laughs> it's all-inclusive. And they have this whole thing in Arabic that we can't understand. And we're, we They go back and forth. What? And then <laughs> the guy leaves, and then we're like, what happened? And he's like, don't worry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they come back. It happens <laughs> multiple times, and it gets more and more heated. And they the, switched to English at one point. Yusuf's like, yeah. all-inclusive. He said, like, yeah. yelling yeah. I thought sort of did it in English for a minute. Yeah. They were getting... <laughs> Annoyed. Yeah. And he's like, I, I sense a tourist trap here. Yeah. You know, that's like right. I sense a tourist trap. They were trying to get us to pay. And, and uh, yeah, Yusuf won. The guy, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yusuf he totally won. won. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I got, was like, what no, did he say? No, no. At the very end, the, the, the waiter is looking at me and just like, he's like, all I need you to do is sign this paper. And I'm like, okay. And Yusuf grabs the pen and he grabs the paper and he slaps the paper down on the table, slaps the pen on top of it and just stares at the guy. <laughs> he's like, he's like, you will sign nothing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you want it, you know, his room number, write it down yourself. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you don't write your name down. Don't sign anything. Yeah. Don't put a number on there. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> so we, we left and the guy, the guy ran past us and probably was going, going to the hotel. hotel. Yeah. We never heard a word about it. We never did. So. We never yeah. heard a word. Yeah. <laughs> what did he tell us? He told the guy at one point, he, he told us that he told the guy, he was like, don't piss off the Americans. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He did. Yeah. 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 Piss off the Americans. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, it, was it was great. funny. Yeah. Yeah, that was that late night start, and he's like, "I sense a tourist trap here." Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is a touristy area. It's actually a really nice area. Like, it's very touristy. It's this little area in Charm where all the hotels are, and it's like a little avenue. It's like a a mini Ve- mini Vegas at night or whatever. Yeah, or mini like Vegas city or outside mall sort of. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It had shows it's nice little shops and fountains and music and yeah, very clean, very upscale, yeah, swanky, you might say. 
Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was cool though. It was. Uh, but the that food, whole trip, yeah, the food was really good. Yeah. Oh man, the seafood was outrageous. Was just, like that. Yeah. Yeah. What did you? Say? He was like, he's like, they're trying to scam us. He's like, but I am a hustler. Right? <laughs> he's like, don't hustle a hustler. Don't, oh, dude. Don't so they, hustle a hustler. So we go back to the. Dude, this is so great. We go back to the hotel. <laughs> And I'm like, let's go to the fucking bar. And so we go over to the bar and it's closed. Oh, man. And I'm like, wait, like, what's the deal? We, we're looking around like, is there any other open bars? And they're like, no, they all closed or whatever. And the guys are the guys are there like cleaning closing up. up, cleaning and stuff. And so we're like, Yusuf's like, can we buy a bottle of wine? And they're like, uh, no, we're closed. And he's like, can I bribe you for a bottle of wine? <laughs> <laughs> and they keep telling him no. That they they're I'll like what? You. Like, like yeah. what? What? And finally, Yusuf in in the middle of the like the lobby area of the hotel, he's like, "I am trying to bribe you for a <laughs> bottle of wine." It says it really like, loud. So loud. It <laughs> echoes in there. It's hilarious, dude. Oh, dude. <laughs> it's so genius. Oh uh, man, it. it was great. And they wouldn't. But we do did it. not get a bottle of wine. No, we didn't. That night. They, they. It was like one o'clock or one thirty. It was whatever. Yeah. It was late. Yeah. We we just got in and it was like ah whatever. We'll, I just I'm like we'll man. Get the wine tomorrow. <laughs> I've got to try this in the United States. <laughs> yeah yeah. <I> just, <laughs> start handing I'm out going to, everywhere. Yeah. Just start yeah. trying to bribe people for like stuff. When I really need something. I'm just gonna be like <laughs> yeah. hey, I am trying to bribe you <laughs> for this thing right now. <laughs> That's what he says. He, everyone he goes up to is, yes, yes, I will make him my cousin. That's Don't right, worry. yeah. And he's not like, he's just like, I want you to meet my cousin. It's yeah. like the waiter at the staff or the chef at the seafood restaurant. He is my cousin. Yeah, Don't worry. He'll bring my cousin. Yeah, and he just right. like goes and orders. He'll go, he does, just skips the whole ordering. He goes and talks to the chefs and tells them what he wants. Yep. How he wants it. And then they Yeah, bring we, it we use the waiter yeah. just for like, give us uh, beers and Beer you know, silverware and, and stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The food just keeps turning up. You're like, holy crap, I thought we were done. Like, next course <laughs> yeah, comes nope, out. Next course. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we ate the biggest damn lobster I'd ever I'd ever eaten. Like oh, that yeah. last night. And he was he was all fired up. He's, I mean, it was also the back end of a lot of work for Yusuf. He's looking forward to it too, like to yeah. chill. And he's like, We're gonna find the best goddamn seafood restaurant in Sham. And it's all on the Red Sea, so the seafood's amazing. And oh, it's uh, so good. Oh my and God. he just was like, We're going and finding this place. And it was just oh dude, it was and I love the guy. He's super generous. I mean, he just, you can't pay for a damn thing around him. Right. It's just, yeah. I mean, he, and he's like that on the tours too with people. Like everyone, people want stuff. It's like people get most gifts the all the time. Way. We yeah. buy the extra tickets. It's just, yeah. It's yeah, just, most I, the same way. I do want to mention that because it's just like uh, Mo and Yusuf, I've just, whether it's, I think it's just luck. I'm so, I feel very lucky to have fallen in and partnered up with these guys in Egypt because. You know, we had people on the tour that when we're flying, taking these domestic flights around, they're hearing other tourists and other groups and they're complaining about this or that and the schedule. And yep. and we heard that from other people who were sitting around in the cafe at Valley of the Kings and we were chatting to some uh, <laughs> some people uh, from another tour and they're like, oh, it's just like, you know, it's get up early, go here for half an hour, get on the bus, go to the next place for half an hour. And yeah. We just, that, none of that happens without you. Like, it's just, people get looked after so well by the staff in Egypt. The, with the, the Kemet School and Select Egypt, which is the travel agency that kind of runs all the logistics for us. It's just, man, they do such a good job. And I'm just, yeah, I, I couldn't be couldn't be happier with the way that people get treated. I agree, man. Uh, yeah, it's, it's over the top. It it's is. Just it's really, like, it's like red carpet all the way. Just yeah. and yeah. Very, Everything is taken care of. Very uh, familial. It's yeah. like the, you, you become like... Like Yusuf says, like, ah, oh, yeah, we're cousins, we're brothers, or we're whatever. Brothers, it's yeah. like that's yeah. I can see the way they interact with the with the people that come on the tour, and it's just like everybody gets this sort of familial sort of relationship, yeah. and it's it's just beautiful. Yeah. It's so it's so good. They they really they run a tight ship. Yeah. They take they care do. of everything, and they're awesome people. On yeah. top of that, and it's just they really are so oh, well and. It, that was the other thing that was a massive privilege for me. It was like, we got a few of us got to go and, and we, you know, it's, it was, the, we got to go and have dinner with at, at one of our oh, tour yeah. guides' houses. That's right. Um, yep. That Mr. blew my Butterwin. mind. So his, his house. So there was a few of us. And we couldn't take, couldn't take everyone. He just, his house is set up. They have a big family. He can host like 10, 15 people. So we, we kind of went out one night and, and went to his house. And I, it was the hospitality. And the welcoming nature of it, just everything is laid out for you. And the food was just, I mean, it was one of the best meals I've ever had. It was just, it was 
unbelievable. And I was really, and just like you said, the hospitality and those guys really care. The most thing they care about is that people feel good about it, that they enjoy their time in Egypt, that they they go away with it as a, as a being a real positive experience. And that's more important to them than than money or any of these other things. I mean, everybody's, yeah, you know, everybody's, it's everybody's, it's all a business at it's the end of the day, but, yeah. but it's a livelihood, but they're, a hundred percent. Their priority is like we're 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 here for for people and to to make them and it shows walk away with with the warm and fuzzies, you know. And it, it shows does show a hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. I, was, that 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 experience so was was amazing. I agree. It blew my mind. Yeah, and they and laid learning. out a, they laid out a legit like picturesque banquet. I mean, the table was just it was stacked, <laughs> massive dude. amounts of food, it's unreal. <laughs> pigeons and ducks and the barbecue beef and and just all yeah. this, you know, the little the little vine leaves, stuffed peppers, the, the and yes. vine leaf yeah. wraps, piles and of just, rice and uh, so bread. It just it was amazing. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Egyptian now, style too, hungry? which was I'm... the best part. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Damn, you guys uh, want to break for dinner? <laughs> just slap a duck and tear its leg off and go for it. Like, yes, that's, that's right. That's li- that's the Egyptian style. It was great. Like we're hands on. And, yeah, uh, it was fantastic. I have to say this though, in in th- this this uh, concept of the family, I learned from that experience. Like what. Because we we look at the buildings when we're going when we're driving through Cairo and there's always these columns sticking up out of the tops of the buildings and there's rebar sticking up out of the top, and we were told, um, in some cases that this is because they don't finish a building, because if they finish it then they get taxed and all this kind of stuff. I heard I heard various different stories or that they're being torn down and maybe some of this is true, but in talking with, uh some of the Egyptians this time, they were saying uh, in many cases they build the house and they build the next story up and leave the columns and the rebar there because when the next generation of the family or someone marries in the family and they're Mm. going to start a new family, they just build out that next floor and build the, and leave the columns on the roof of that. And the, that family moves into that floor. And right. They just keep doing this. Mahmoud told you this, Tito. I can't remember who told me. It might have been Yusuf. Mm. Um, yeah. But yeah, so when we went to the dinner, it's it looked like we were walking into a restaurant. Yeah, on the bottom floor of what l- almost looks like a small hotel. Yeah, it was pristine. It it's tiling. Pristine. It was amazingly yeah. beautifully yeah. done. Waiting room, giant yep. family in there, and then the 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 building across the street is there like you know, cousins, they're related. They, the, the buildings yeah. next to the house were floor distant, family. more distant family members. <laughs> yeah. And that really struck me about their culture. Yeah. And, um, uh, yeah, I just feel like yeah, that's, how deeply important the family yes, is and they're all the together. And, it, yeah. and, and yep. so you can kind of see in the way that they, that what they, they treat each other like Yusuf does. Like we were joking about how he makes these people, his cousin and his brother or whatever after that. But that's just kind of the way they grow up Yeah, in dealing with each other. Yeah. You are around yeah. your family and extended family all the time. Right. And it's a beautiful thing. Uh, the way they are with each other is uh, just, I don't know. To, to me, it, it really, really, is wonderful and I love it. And I want to yeah. go back right now. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> I mean, and that, that was the other, th- I mean, in Luxor, like Yusuf was describing the character of, of the men. Like this was, you remember him? I don't know if he was, you were on yeah, the bus. He was I, talking I, about this, that they were like, if you the, the idea of being a man in, in Luxor and it's like the, if you were to look up to role models and the way that's all structured and particularly around that Luxor region, like the reputation of, of the men there, it's, it's, you know, honorable, respectful, caring, you know, respect the women, respect your neighbors, respect everybody else. I mean, it's, it's, you know, they, they live a different life to, 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 to what you do in the West, but they are just, and it's the same thing. Like people think Egypt's dangerous and all of this. It's not remotely like that. There's no street crime there. Like there's no, you don't have problems with, you know, gangs or, or, or that type of street crime at all yeah. because it's the community gets involved with that at every level. Like it's not, you know, they're not relying on on police to take care of it if and when it that sort of thing does happen. It's just it's very rare. But yeah, you can you can see that and and in particular in that Luxor area, they say that's the 
that's what they teach the boy. Like that's if you want to be a man, like that's what it means to you have to be honorable and respectful and mm, and and be beautiful. a friend to people even in, in hard times, not just a friend in, in good times. Like give them them goddamn clothes off your back, and that's the sense you get. Like they would help you out no matter what. Um, so yeah, it was it's it's a real honor, and it was a real honor getting to go to their house and and to Butterwee's house and, and and spend time with them. I, I I love those guys. Like I've spent you know, a few trips with them now and, and gotten to know them. And yeah, it's, it's a, it's an honor. It's a, it's, it's, it's certainly a lot to be said for that way of life. I think, like you said, yeah, yeah. Oh, like it's, we've definitely fallen in love with the culture and the people and the yeah. style it's, and the sort of magnificent controlled chaos that is <laughs> all of Egypt. It. Oh my God. <laughs> Fantastic. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, even, their history too. I mean, that that day we spent at the end of the trip, we went to Islamic Cairo, and we went oh, to all man. these mosques. Yeah, and mm. I, my mind was blown. I mean, it was, you know, we have. I've been to the Sistine Chapel and the Vatican and stuff, but I tell you what, the architecture in these almost Gothic mosques and the domes, and it's just, it's, it's absolutely wonderful. And I, it's almost something I want to include on future tours because, I mean, not only just for that aspect of the artwork, it's, it's absolutely, it's profound and it's. Yeah, absolutely jaw-droppingly beautiful. These entire structures made from calcite. There's there's also tons of recycled Egyptian right. material, in it, like ancient Egyptian of material, remnants of c- granite columns reused, Column. and just like yeah. stuff that are, are obvious artifacts. That was one of the reasons yeah. why Yusuf wanted to take us. That was a that was an excellent part of the trip. Yeah, and there are cow days. There were lots of cow days. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I love the the thing about the mosque. Um, one of my favorite things is this central fountain. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You come into the mosque and you go in and it opens into like this big, beautiful courtyard, this giant courtyard. And then there's the, uh, is it three or four, um, the alcoves that are the schools? The four schools. The yeah. Four, yeah schools the four schools surrounding this courtyard. And in the middle is this round, ornate, beautiful gigantic fountain structure thing that has these uh columns these very short columns all around where you can sit and put your feet in the trough of water yeah. at the edge of the fountain and wash your feet and of course there are no shoes in inside the mosque but the shoe is not supposed to touch the surface so you That's can right. they they yeah. they actually sell you these little bags you can put over your shoe which is interesting yeah. but we took the shoes off in most cases. Uh, but yeah, just looking at this fountain and you can see the worn, polished surface of the small column that was for the seats for all of the asses that sat there to watch their feet <laughs> yeah, and just yeah. polish this piece of... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. But it's so cool. I don't know. There was just something about that. It's like, take your shoes off when you come into this. Place. That's right. That's another mystery solved, yeah, yeah. right? That's how you polish this hard stone. Thousands of years of, of asses. <laughs> asses. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was, it was, uh, it was calcite, right? Right. Yeah. Not, not yeah, too yeah. Hard, I know. Not super hard. Trying to make a joke here, man. Yeah, it was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> That's how they did it. Well, before what, is this this segment's now half over. Let's go back to the yeah, therapy. I know, and we're, I know. We're, I'm yeah, skipping yeah. Sorry, we, we, we got way there's so track. much. You yeah. can't do it in one show, so we're going where we're going. Uh, yeah, we, you can't yeah. do it all in one show. We're going to do many shows about this, but yeah, yeah. But we were talking about you making the map of the therapy yeah. and what you were doing. So I would just I already talked about the map. I would like to just state this. And I'm going to go through this footage and and the pictures and stuff later on the show. We we could do a video maybe. But the boxes that I got into this time uh, were very interesting. Not there, there were some that were very precise and just pristine, polished interior surface. Seemed like very mm-hmm. square edges. I didn't bring in um, any kind of precision tools to measure the angles and all that kind of stuff. I was mainly going in to just observe and also check the resonant frequencies. And you're getting the frequencies for measurement measurement purposes, basically, right? Yeah, sort comparison of? purposes, yeah, okay. right? Comparison, to compare the yeah. boxes to each other. Yeah. It's the easiest way that I can compare the dimensions of the box to each other. Yeah. If you... If I took a laser measuring device and stuck it on one wall and shot it at the other wall how do i know that if i moved it two feet down it would be the same or 
Yeah, whatever, and also right? the walls are reflective and it's kind of a pain, right? Mm. Yeah. It can be. Yeah. So the point is, is with the with the resonant frequency, it just gives you a general average. This is the size. Yeah. Um, but the main thing I want to point out is that the interior of these boxes that I saw were definitely purposefully left out of symmetry. Like one of them had this giant lump on the inside of the, of the box, like at the floor level, like the walls coming down straight. And then suddenly it just juts out and there's this big chunk that was never cut out. Mm. And Mm. it looked like someone later had taken a hammer and chisel to this lump on the inside of this box and tried to cut it out. out And I have video to show this, but I'm, I mean, this, this had to have been done later. This is my hypothesis that someone later came along and tried to cut this chunk that was left in out because there Mm. are polished surfaces around it, but then there's just like obvious hammer and chisel marks on this huge lump left in Mm. another box that I got in the one that had the, the corner piece left in on the inside corner. It was just like never, never completely cut out. Uh, It also had a, across the entire other bottom, uh, sidewall or end wall, a four to six inch piece in the bottom corner that just, it didn't cut to the bottom of the corner. It left like a bevel right on the inside. Yeah. Polished beautifully. I checked the outside. The outside of the box is cut away. Cut away. On that corner. That, yeah. Yeah, that's the interesting thing you were saying that I was like, whoa, okay. Yeah. So. so the so the on the on the other side where it was just the like the right inside bottom corner, so it's this sort of triangular piece that's or part of the stone that is not cut away to make the three axes meet at ninety degree yep. angles to each other. It's it's a pretty big chunk. Uh, you could put your foot on it. That's how big the that they didn't take out mm. of that. Yep three-way corner there on the outside of the box that outside that corner, corner is, is missing off. yeah it's missing yeah. so it's yeah. telling me that like they're leaving that purposefully on the inside because they know they cut away some flaw like in the they, stone on the they outside require a certain thickness of, yes yeah also that's freaking weird yeah also i was in inside a box that had giant scoop marks taken out of the floor in multiple places that one of them was like so big, I could put my entire foot into it and it would almost come up to the, my ankle bone. That's how big the scoop was out of the floor of the inside of the box. And there were multiple scoop marks out of the floor of the inside of this box. So it's like Chris Dunn says, like the, the, the advanced ability of their tools allowed them to make precision cuts to make precision angles but they didn't have to do that have to. and they didn't actually what they cared right. about was something else something else even though they could make some of them because then yeah. i get in one and it's just perfect all the angles all the way to the corner three axes just i mean pristine down to like you know like chris dunn says it's like what is the radius in that three-way corner it's three-way so corner, small yeah. tiny maybe an eighth of an inch i don't know i didn't yeah i, I just didn't have time to do all the things. I think the most important thing was making the map and getting just the footage generally yeah. of e- inside of each box and kind of figuring out which one's which. It's it's such an interesting observation. I, I think, like you said, it seems like it, that correlation between like these divots and and things on the inside that seem to match what's happening on the outside, like you said, Russ, it's like they were going for a certain material thickness for whatever yeah. reason. Yeah, that's, like the that. first, that's the first that thing that comes have to mind. Yeah, yeah. And you, and you, there are, I mean, that's the thing you're saying, like, and, and I've seen some of these, they're unfinished, whether it's unfinished or it's deliberate, like some of it may be unfinished. We know that it was unfinished because we have unfinished boxes. Yep. Um, and you have this material thickness that there are some boxes like the exploded box that, that Mariette blew up. I mean, that are pristine and they're flat and they're sharp yep. corners and you can, there's plenty of places in there where you measure the, you know, where measurements been done either by Chris Dunn or Armand Adley and other people where, they show you these, you know, uh, perfect angles and things like that. But like you said, that may not have been the specific objective. Like if they can make it thick enough and perfectly flat and square enough, then they can do it. But 
yeah, it seems like they're yeah they're they're, they're going for something else. Like they're going for a, a thickness or a solid. I the other observation I make about that place is that it also seems, and this is the the scoop marking, the scoop discussion is that they're going for solidity. Like they're just yes. these boxes have to be solid. Like mm. that's the that was and, why it's so cool to get back in to see that Cambusus box, the giant big black one that's in the the, cl- the, the closed off area that yeah. they parked into. That's they literally it's just the craziest thing. This box, it's and this is where it's like, yeah, you guys with your pulleys and cap stands and and pivoting off a post and all these ideas. Like this thing is parked in a yeah, corner. Like it's literally into back yeah. into a corner. Show me the cap stands that can get that thing into that corner. <laughs> well, show me, show me, show me any post that you or the where's the hole for the post that you apparently pivoted a, a seventy ton block of granite around that didn't just knock it over straight away. Like yeah, yeah. It's 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 a I, this is not this is not something you can do with with some of those models. But the reason they parked it there and they never quite finished it is because it developed this giant crack in it, like a big, you know, a, a big crack in the the front face of it. That, that splits the stone, but it, you know, the box is perfectly serviceable well, that, well, if you were to use it as a, you know, as a, as a, as a box for some bull bones or whatever. But I think because it developed this crack, they just said, well, this is ruined. We can't use it, shove it in the back corner and forget about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's, this is the thing that really blows me away is that like, if they needed the integrity to be such that they scooped out cracks, that they, that they left, interior dimensions odd because the exterior dimensions had to be cut away to get rid of flaws in the stone. Mm. Uh, why, why did they yeah, need why? to be polished on the insides and out? Like if, if you're mm. going to put this lid on it and no one's ever going to see what's inside, why does it need to be well, polished in there? Well, why does it, it need to be solid? Like none of these things are requirements for any of the stated standard model. Purposes that's what I'm saying. Right? Like yeah. I can understand a crack. Where, let's say, if you're going to put a liquid in there, that's a very, very thin liquid that would it actually go right through that crack and come out, right? Right. It would come out if it was thin enough. Yeah, the box would leak. That's what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that that's understandable. But does polish is 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 the polish necessary to see the cracks? Because I know, like with with steel, like when you're working with hydraulics and stuff, that's one of the things you you would do is is clean the surface and smooth the surface out. And that's when you can begin to see, see the, the cracks yeah, the flaws. Mm. and the flaws there in the go. stone. Um, another way to see the flaws in the stone is to spread some uh, liquid on, on it. And then you'll right. see it, it seep into that crack. Yeah. I don't know. It's, yeah, I mean, so it's it, mind it, boggling. It, the why question, like why does it need to be solid? Why does it need to be polished? Why does it need to be perfect yeah. where it's perfect or, you know, maintain a thickness where they're maintaining a thickness yeah. on it. I don't know. It's, it just, again, it's, it's all clear screams that function that's what to they me. Were I, I, yeah. I mean, I come back to that whole relationship between precision and function. Um, there's plenty of examples of astonishing precision in these boxes and in others, you know, one of the, there's, and there's a strong relationship between, you know, you don't develop precision and the capability for precision, unless you're chasing some functional benefit from it. That's, if you're just if it's artistic or ceremonial, you color with it. You you know you're more or less coloring within the lines, and you're fine. But that's the whole nature of precision and how it's evolved in the modern world too. I mean, it, that was all developed in in the pursuit of function. It was so we could make cannons shoot straighter. We could make you know cr- chronometers that kept time accurately, and all of these things. That's the development of modern precision. Yeah, it, the same thing applies to this stuff. You don't develop those capabilities unless you're changing. Or you're chasing some functional return, and Russ, we were talking about this in the break, but it's like what annoys me about this whole discussion and the back and forth that seems to happen around the Serapium is that we we only have a handful of measurements to go on. Yeah, we have like Chris Dunn's measured them in a few spots. I know Armin Adley's measured them in a, in a bunch more spots. He's an Egyptian engineer, makes great videos. They're in Arabic. They're still worth watching. Um, he's gone in there with precision tools and measured in a lot of places and shows you you know, the perfect angles and flatness of, of stuff. And you can use the, you know, BAM and Patrice Poyard. They went and did stuff with surface roughness meters, which gives you an indication of the flatness of the surface over a small area. Um, but there's just like a handful of measurements. What what we actually need to have happen is is have these Complete. things be scanned yeah. accurately yes. with proper scanners that cost whatever, seventy or $100,000, like the work that Patrice has done in the, the Barabar Caves in India, because the results of those scans are absolutely astonishing and, and 
mind blowing, and and it's certainly the basis for a lot of further study. And Russ, you were saying that, you know, while we were running around in there playing this hide and seek game with with some of the keepers while we're in the in the actual alcoves, you know, hiding behind the boxes, you know, trying to take microscope pictures of of either like these fine machining marks or tool marks or bits of the liquid polish. I mean, you, you're saying you got you got pissed off and yeah. angry like this is. Yeah. yeah, I was getting. I got. I I got pretty annoyed because I'm I'm hiding behind a box. I've got this microscope connected to my phone, and like people are walking up there, and I'm like, I'm trying not to get busted, but I'm also trying to do proper, some kind of scientific investigation of these boxes, what I can, and I'm just like, why am I having to do this? Yeah, this is annoying. Like I shouldn't have to do this. Like I'm hiding, and you know, trying not to get busted, and just trying to trying to understand these things properly and it's 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 just incredibly annoying like i know that you know the those keepers that are in there they're not they're not trying to stop me from doing science they don't want to lose their jobs they're right doing that, their job yeah right? they don't want to lose their job right right so but but there's a whole hierarchy of things happening there and and in the end i'm like why am i even having to do this this should be done properly by people with correct equipment like ben was saying with good thousand you know multi hundred thousand dollar scanners this all should have been done already but because it's like it's there's this this mainstream narrative that we know what these are so there's no further science need be done right and it's just ridiculous and so we're running around hiding climbing around sweating trying not to get busted you know trying to run a tour at the same time as trying to do proper science kyle's jumping in and out of boxes i'm jumping in and out of boxes ben is jumping in and out of boxes and the whole thing is like there's this kind of uh, like you know, stealth aspect to it that's just really annoying. Like, why am I hiding yeah. with a microscope? You know, uh, you were just grumpy that day. <laughs> I think it's great. <laughs> I mean, yeah. On one on one hand, on one hand, it's kind of fun, but at, on the other hand, I'm like, this is why do I have to do it this way? Yeah, you know, Russ and Ben are notorious for being grumpy. <laughs> yeah. I uh, figured this out. I'm glad, I'm glad. I'm glad somebody else has been added to that team. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I, I, I blaze him I get times, grumpy. Folks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I see Ben. Oh, he's getting grumpy again. All right, here we go. He's up the back getting grumpy. Damn it, all right, I'm going to fucking get a tea. <laughs> yeah, I'm templed out. <laughs> <When's lunch? laughs> templed out. Yeah, lunchtime. Is it lunchtime yet? <laughs> Let's go to lunch. I've seen it. <laughs> Yeah, I understand so, what you're it, saying. The the gist of it is is that this should have been done right. professionally. Was, and what's pissing me off is that that is that is not that it's not fun to do it this way, but at this, you know, we're doing Indiana Jones stuff, but it, what's pissing me off is that it should be already done. Yeah. That's what's pissing me off. And the fact that we have to run around and, and sneak around and hide doing it because we're only allowed to be in there as tourists and any any you know like Yusuf says to the people at the beginning of the tour any sign that you're not being touristy and they're going to start getting suspicious like like that guy in the Sharm El Sheikh museum when we were paying all that attention to the horror statue he's oh like what God, are they doing yeah. why, 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 why are they looking at the statue and Yusuf <laughs> is like it's a beautiful statue what's wrong and they're you know they're fascinated by it now of course we're Kyle's trying to scan it and I'm taking images of the polish and stuff so the dude I scanned it yeah, yeah. So the dude... He's like, no video. Right. No video. <laughs> yeah. Videos? I'm like, no. I'm, I'm, I'm not, not taking video. I'm not taking, taking 10,000 photographs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is not a video. I'm scanning it with lasers. This is a hugely <laughs> different thing. <laughs> but that's the point. Like, the guy got suspicious yeah, yeah. because we took a scientific interest in that object, and he could tell the difference. Yeah. He could tell the difference in, like, a tourist looking at it and the way we were looking at it. And that's why he got suspicious. And that's the, the root of the problem there. It is, and it's, it's something that's annoyed me, and I constantly call for it in my videos too. It's it's like this. There are so many low-hanging fruits mm. of non-destructive, completely benign, yeah. and completely achievable experiments, measuring, like, like scans, these things that can be done to, to shed light on these mysteries and to peel those onion layers back a bit further and understand a bit more about how precise is it? What's the comparison between all of these boxes? What's the relative internal dimensions? What's... You know, what is the overall flatness of the surfaces and what, you know, what's the, how many of the angles are perfect and how many are like, it's just, these things all should be done. And it's, it's just, I think there's like, it's just a, yeah, it's, it's a, there's a blockage in there because like you say, we've kind of closed the case on it. We know what they were for, therefore no more science needs to be done. And people, I think, unfortunately in the, in the academic realms are a little too afraid of stepping outside of the, you yeah. know, the, the, the core tenets of that, of that of that dogmatic sort of belief system 
uh, to, to risk their jobs or careers. And those are the people with the permissions and the capabilities to do it and the budgets to do it. And, yeah. you know, we, you know, there's, we can't talk in too much detail about it, but we had a good example of that on this tour. We had some people that, that were with us and, and I mean, very interested in these topics, very intelligent, well-placed people in, in very interesting fields that, that, really couldn't be included or named or, you know, yeah, shown to have right. been taking an interest in this field because if they were, it would threaten their academic positions and, and their current, their current sort of, you know, I mean, occupations to some degree, like That's just right. because if they were associated with this quote unquote fringe beliefs and science and, and it's legitimate science that's trying to happen and, you know, trying to figure out some of the answer to this stuff, but it's like, they're real careful to like, we can't be, included in this because uh being seen to be doing so would would threaten our kind our of livelihood yeah in, in exactly. our livelihood and, and our, in these in these academic circles and that's what happens like that's yeah i read a great article that was written about hancock's thing we're seeing it now like with, with hancock's uh you know ancient apocalypse series where it's just the kickback that's happening in there and we're see, starting to see some articles being written about the the kind of dogmatic response of of mainstream academia in this in this space and and I mean, I know it. A lot of disciplines of science suffer from this, but in particular, in this one, it's like, man, there is a a real dogmatic core of this story that that is that is very central to it. And if you start threatening that story, or some, or bring up topics and want to investigate and go in lines that could potentially threaten this story, then yeah, you're you you are immediately ostracized and people lose their jobs. I mean, I, I haven't. I can. There's a number of examples of that exact thing happening. It happened to. A scientist at, in Tiwanaku, and when he went and looked at confirming some of some of Poznansky's sort of astronomical dating of that site, that guy lost his job when he when he confirmed some of his readings mm. and conclusions. I mean, these things, yeah, these things happen, and and it's it's sad that it's down to this type of you know guerrilla style science that can only happen piecemeal with kind of you know consumer grade equipment because I can't afford. To Bring a seventy thousand dollars scanner to Egypt. Not that I'd be able to get it in or use it right. effectively, because they'd stop you from doing it. Uh, you know, there's a real bottleneck here, and, and the people with the permissions and capability to do it aren't doing it. I think for fear that it it might threaten this this story. Some of the conclusions might threaten this story. That's that's at the core of the whole tube drill thing. Like the reason there's a tilted photograph in one of the textbooks, and that nobody will ever admit that there is in fact spiral grooves on some of these these drill cores it's because the the implications of that threaten the this whole primitive tool narrative story that's that's going on in ancient egypt and right. it, it means that some of the conclusions are wrong like same know, thing happened with the sphinx uh, enclosure erosion i mean this is you can see it yeah. happening over and over again yeah yeah for sure it's frustrating i have so much to say <clears throat> first of all johnson you're not gonna get fired oh boy don't worry we were just drinking beers in egypt <laughs> anyways <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> A couple of things. One about about the precision in in the serapium, as you pointed out, like there's only been a couple of measurements taken uh, in places that you know can show over a certain area or linear linear uh, length that there is very precise and flat surfaces and right angles. Um, it is not the case in in every box. I was in one box that was like really wonky like it, the back oh, yeah. wall was obviously yeah. tilted towards me and the whole thing was skewed and it and my point is in saying this is that when it comes to precision if you can do it if you can make a precise flat surface and precise right angles on all these different axes and then parallel walls and all that kind of stuff that that in and of itself even if it's one object out of all the objects shows it's 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 almost zero chance you would do this by hand by accident because of the size of these things and how much surface you have to flatten inside that space so that's what illustrates the advancement of the tools and yet they didn't need it to be precise they just could be precise when the stone itself allowed, allowed for it yeah. for it because yeah. what they cared about was this integrity of the stone. So that's the point I want to make about that. That's a great point. And, and well, hold on. I've let's, we got, yeah, let's, yeah. let's take a break. We've gone way long and then we'll, we'll finish. We got one more segment. 
Yeah. Okay. I, I, was, I had another point and I forgot it. it go, go ahead. We're going <laughs> long gonna, on purpose. <laughs> I'm, I'm override. What? <laughs> override. Okay. No, I was, yeah, yeah, I was going to say, that, yes, I like that's, that's an observation. And, and I've learned a lot about the Serapium since I first made some content on it and talked about it. It was one of my earliest, you know, like three or four years ago at this point. Um, it's one of the reasons I want to revisit that site in, in content and write a bunch about it again and, and, and dive into it. And I've been, I've been swapping emails with Chris Dunn about it too. And he's, he's also, you know, he's writing a new book and he, he's getting into a bunch of these different topics as well. Uh, and, and revisiting this as well. Cause I think you're right. Like it's, yeah, there's, there's, there's examples of, of extreme precision and they certainly seem to have had the capability for it, but that may not have been what they were shooting for is, is, right, a, is a fantastic right. observation. Like that's not, you know, having this thing be perfectly square and flat may not have been the ultimate goal. It might have been something to do with thickness and solidity. And if they could do it where the stone allowed it, they did. But if they didn't, they worked. They worked around it. Seems yes. like they worked yeah, around it for the right. for the because that functional outcome they were chasing, they could achieve. I think they were with in a hurry. Result. Yeah, that's yeah. yes. You get the idea that yeah, they were kind of in a hurry. hurry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. And that they eventually were interrupted, right? Because it's that's right. They were in a hurry and they didn't yeah. finish. Yep. Mm. Let's take a break. All right. I'm calling it. You are. You guys are I can't assholes. override the second call. <laughs> I've, I've, <laughs> override cancel. <laughs> Veto only works once. <laughs> we'll be right back. See Dread Van Kirkwick Band. <laughs> That's it. Well, this is the final segment, and it's hopefully going to be a long one because uh, there's a lot to say here. We're just going to let it go until we decide to wrap. We're already we went long on that last one, but uh, yeah, it's deserved. We hadn't done a show in freaking three or four weeks, yeah. So. Oh, good. I haven't done a podcast in about four months. <laughs> <laughs> You've been traveling a lot. Good. Yeah. We told them. Yeah. Got lots of material. Way back huh? in the beginning. Yeah, that, bro. Uh, we'll go look at stuff and they won't get episodes. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true. Promises yes. delivered. <laughs> Promises delivered. <right. laughs> Promises kept. <laughs> yeah. I have to admit, uh, I have a terrible confession to make, folks. I wussed out. And I did not climb the uh, well shaft in the mm. pyramid. Just want to get that out there. <laughs> I'm ashamed. <laughs> yeah. But oh well, maybe next time. Mm. Yeah. I have a lot we, of excuses, but I won't bore though. you with those. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> First we excuse I will explain, and that is <laughs> Ben showed me a video. <laughs> Christian. Our buddy Christian <laughs> climbing that shaft. Yeah, holy crap! Mm. Fuck you, bro. That's one of the reasons why I didn't do it because I was like, damn, that looks really hard. <laughs> but thank you for doing that. Actually, yeah. that was great. Yeah, um, yeah, I need to do it. Just uh, maybe put the uh, Great Pyramid on the front end <laughs> at some point, so I'm not <laughs> worn out. All batteries dead. Yeah, I'm doing. 15 pull-ups in the Serapium trying to get out of the damn I know, boxes. Dude, yeah. that dude, that was the other thing. Seven boxes in and out. And mm. like, not only that, but you have to climb down the structure of a lot of those to yeah, get into, into the, alcove. the alcove and, and yeah. like hurry and be quiet. Yep. yep. People don't realize how deep those things are. Dude, like, yeah, they are deep. Are 10 and feet deep or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, they're deep. And it's, man, I was fucking, I was worn out after that. Well, I have a couple of, uh, before we move on from the Serapium, I do, there was a couple things that I was thinking about just in general, looking at the state of all the boxes. And you can see this when you look at pictures of it, the placements of the lids in general on these boxes. Uh, there, so there was one that was never opened. It was closed. And that's the one that was blown up in order to look inside. And it was empty. 
we're told. Uh, the rest of them, the lids are have the appearance of having been slid off a bit to get the in, it, access to the interior space. What's interesting to me is that if those boxes were had something in them that was large, you wouldn't be able to get it out of there with the lids the way they are. So it seems like, and this may be not true, but it seems like, uh, you know, just I was thinking about this, that maybe they were full of small things if they had stuff in them. So the lid gets slid off and just, and you, you can kind of imagine this, the lid is sitting on the box and it has a bunch of, it has all this inertia. So you set up some kind of system to pull on the lid to get it to move and then it slides a bit and that's it. That's all they did. And each lid has moved a certain amount some of them are kind of turned a bit. Some of them have slid slid straight forward or towards the back, uh, just whichever direction. But it seems like they moved the lids once, and and it stopped it there just so they could look inside the box. And some of the lids have only been slid so much that you can't even really climb down in there. Like at I least can. at least one of them is is. It's, I mean, it's a tiny crack. Yeah, I got in one yeah. that I barely fit into. And I was like, man, I'm kind of worried about this, but I, I did it. You got in there? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm for sure there's one that you can't. Like, there's one that I walked on the top of and I was looking down on it. And it's, it's, yeah, it's, there's a small, it's only open a fraction. Like, I don't think, I'd, yeah, it'd be difficult to get, you might put Sophie down in there, but. Yeah, like a kid, don't have maybe. Else. Yeah. Right. So, in other words, there's not going to be anything. Like, in other words, the implication to me was that somebody opened all these boxes and they were all empty. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because if there was something bigger, if there's something big in to, there, all the lids would be on the floor next to the box, broken. They would have to yeah. slide the lid all the way off, right? None yeah, of the lids none are of off. The lids are on the floor. Right. That's a really good point. Right. They just they somebody went through there and systematically opened every box and only opened it mm. enough to look in, and I don't think that they found anything in there. Yeah, I think I think that's a great observation because you yeah right yeah I I. I that is a great observation. You're not getting anything big out of there with the lids where they are. Oh, right. and by the way, not for nothing. But the other thing I hear get thrown up about the 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 you know the serapium is like, well, Marriott found the you know found the remnants of pulleys. Right. What do you think the pulleys were used for? Right. Opening the boxes. How do you, how do you think they got the exactly? <laughs> like this is, and the Egyptologists know that there were pulleys found there. Like this would have been front page news for Egyptology and for ancient Egypt because they were not known to have used pulleys. There's no examples of them. They don't draw it. There's no seams. There's no nothing yeah. of them using those types of force multipliers. But for damn sure, the Romans and, every, and the Greeks and people after that certainly did. Sure. And and the remnants of wooden pulleys in there. We know there was later occupation, I think. Yeah. I don't, I don't think they were used in order to move the boxes around so much as this is probably the evidence of people shifting those lids. I right. would say, though, <clears throat> my argument that there – was something in those boxes is that one of them was still closed. That's, that's the thing that tells me that there was something in all of the open boxes. It doesn't well. have to be something that's big enough to uh, require to take the lid all the way off. But I think, like, my thought is that mm. the reason one box was not opened was because they knew it was empty. Yeah. That's because if you're gonna a, if you're gonna open that's, a, that's an argument that's an argument for them being empty though. Like if there was stuff in the other boxes, then they wouldn't have left one closed. Right. So unless they had knowledge of what the, was in them. Yeah. So he's making the point oh, yeah. that and somebody it's valuable. Yeah. Somebody whoever opened the boxes knew already what was in the boxes and which ones had stuff in them, and they just didn't open the box that was empty. That's one possibility. That's that's, that's my thought. Right. Another uh, possibility is that they were opened by much later people who didn't know what was in them. Uh, that doesn't explain why they didn't open that last box, though. That's the problem. I mean, that, you're, you're going to go through 20... of the effort. You're going to go... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they died I mean. while opening it. <laughs> <laughs> well, eventually, it's like, God damn it, like 24 yeah. of them, like, or whatever it is, like, we opened 20 of them, the last one's still shut, like, stuff this. Yeah. We're not, we're, not, we're not spending another week trying to pry this damn lid off. Right. And I mean, I don't know if that box. I don't think maybe it, they it didn't, didn't know it was there. It, what did? Well, yeah. I mean, what if those, the well, alcove was sealed up? Yeah. Sealed up. That's yeah. right. We interesting too in that back room, that back that back area that we got into. Like there is still a sealed up alcove in there. 
and you could look through it. Like there was a couple holes in the brick wall and you could see into it. It was an empty alcove, but yeah. it was still like Look, a sealed alcove. You That's would right. only need to move the lid and open the box two inches or three uh, inches to get a torch and to see if it's empty. Right. Uh, so I'm you shove a, like a little mirror in there or something. You got to open it enough to stick your head in there and look around. I mean, maybe yeah, they were doing maybe. that. Like it's enough enough for a head yeah that's what i'm imagining is like you know you the, the lid's sitting there and you it's massive however many tons and so you set up this whole system with pulleys and ropes and pry bars and everything and you finally get it moving once and it <laughs> slides and that's it yeah you know mm -hmm. you don't think so i don't think so you might get it to slide like two inches and then it <laughs> stops it stops and then you got to keep going mm-hmm well, that once that yeah, it's like hit, pull, like pull. They probably pulled it a bunch and a bunch and a bunch and a bunch. And I don't know. You think that I don't know. I'm just thinking of the mechanics of doing it. If you can, if you you get your whole apparatus set up there and all the people and whatever else it takes to like yank on the ropes, and you start moving the lid. You move it a little bit, then you pull again and you pull again, like it like that chain gang work. You got everybody there on the ropes. Keep pulling, keep pulling, keep pulling. Yeah. There's guys. The guy's probably opening it with the expectation of, well, we're going to be able to shove someone in there to check it out or whatever. Keep pulling, keep pulling, keep pulling. And then you get to a point where it's like, all right, stop. Now we can go look. Yeah. And I, I can imagine in that system, you're going to open it more than just like a crack. You want to open that yeah. a foot or two or three or whatever and just depending on how easy it's shifting. Right. And it wasn't clear. I mean, because a lot of them are like, you know, they're hanging off the, the edge of it. Like it's not, obviously, they're not just pulling them straight. Pulling There's, them straight, right. It just they're, they're it slid in whatever and, direction yeah. it could slide from, from whatever, yeah. whichever way they were able For to mount sure. things. Yeah. And what, some, it, some of them have the big, uh, some of the lids have big, like, square holes dug into them. And those square holes, we noticed, are not s nice and square and are not polished. They're roughly cut out of them. Uh, mm -hmm. so that seems like, again, later people like m trying to make, uh, places to pry on the lids from it's not, in other words, yeah. those aren't, those aren't part of the original box. The other thing is that box that we got through the closed door to go see. Yeah. It's lid is also slid off. It's not and it's all, an inset lid. yeah, it's not all the way on there. So that's the next question is, did the, did somebody try to open that one as well? Or, you know. <laughs> That's a tough question because that thing does have lifting bosses it on it. It has lifting bosses on it. And it's an inset lid. I don't know. In fact, this, I'd love to know if there are any other boxes that have an inset lid. This thing actually had a lip. Yeah. An inset lip. And then the, the lid had an inset shift. So you couldn't have slid the lid off that I one. I think that's how they cracked it. You, you slide to. the lid on and it falls into that hole and cracks the side of the mm. box. <laughs> okay. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> and they're like, don't build them like that anymore. Yeah, maybe, right? <laughs> I mean, that's just a, one in the again, corner. it's just a guess, you know, but. And then they would have to take the lid off again, though. It seems that the lid yeah. is like shoved on there and it, it seems like it's been, open. I don't understand. Yeah, Right. It's, it was, I was, that, I was interested in that. It's like that lid, <sighs> you know, if it's, did somebody open it or did the builders actually shove it back there and then just throw the lid on top of it without closing it? Because they yeah. didn't care, you know. God. Everything about that box is a annoying mystery. It's just. This is the other like thing. It's unfinished state. The, it's in the back corner and the lid's off it like it's cracked. What yeah, the, the lid's the open, but it's on the top of the box. <laughs> so this is what I'm saying. Did they, it didn't look to me like they were moving those boxes around in those tunnels with the lids on them. They put the lids on no. afterward, right? So this well, means- In fact, you have, you have evidence for that with the right. unfinished box, the lids in the hallway, and then also the lid for the big rose granite boxes near the entrance. Yeah. yeah. So this is the questions that come up with that box back there. Did they have to take the lid back off of it in order to get it, you know, to, to put it back there? And if that's mm. the case and it was broken and they didn't, weren't going to use it anyway, why did they bother lifting the lid and putting it on top of the box when they're just shoving it yeah. in the corner? They could have just set it down next to it, but they did all this right. extra work to put the lid up on top of it. Yeah. It's weird. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, and that's a big lump of stone. Yeah. That lid is gigantic. Right. If they're just throwing it away, why is the lid on top of it? And it's, it's different weird. than the other, it's, it's very strange. different than the other box. It has the square corners and the rounded top. Yep. Um, it's definitely mm. a different style than is normal down in there. Most of the Serapian boxes have the beveled lids. Beveled. Yep. They're like these prism shapes. It's, it, it's so Yeah, I, I, it was, well, it has a rough beveled shape on the lid on top doesn't it no it's square it's square you're right it's not uh, it's not beveled i thought it was round on the top but it has the square corners 
Is that so, not yeah, right? square no. and then a rounded top and the square ends. Yeah, yeah it's, the, it's, the, it's, the ends are square and the and, and when then it's you look at the top, so it's rounded, so it's like been artistically yeah. made. That's a good point. I, it's very different man. than the other boxes. And so is the the rose granite box. Like that one is very different, and it doesn't have a lid. Or at least the lid is the lid somewhere is, else. Yeah, the lid's in somewhere the, else. It, it's but near but, the entrance. It's that big piece of stone you walk in, turn left. It's right yeah, there. Yeah, but that wall, the walls of this that is, box this are freaking like 18 inches thick. This is the They're, top of yeah, the it's lid. It's incredibly thick. Of that other box. Yeah, it's rounded on the top and it has square the corners. The square corners. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And the nubs on the end, right? Very and different the style. The lifting boss is probably more accurate. Yeah. Oh well, yeah, and then you got the small box, and you got the limestone box. I think the small box could be an Egyptian product, a dynastic yeah. product. Yeah, um, nothing rules that out. Uh, it's got the rounded it, uh, in. It's in, rounded. Yeah, on the rounded end. inside, and it's like, was it coming in, going out? Because it has that whole tunnel behind it to the alcove. Right. right? Yep. That you guys saw for the first time as well, right? We went. Yeah, back we there. got to walk back down the tunnel. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then. Uh, and then there's that one box made of limestone that's literally in this tiny, like it's crammed in this alcove. It's a giant box, but it's limestone. Yeah, yeah. It's unfinished. It's rough. You definitely chisel. Very rough. Yeah. But and the lid on that one is on it. I don't even know if it's off it. I'm thinking from memory. It seems like it's actually it's been pried. I think there's like some wood. Yeah, under they there. pried like it up and, 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 and put, pried put it up, slats under it so that they could look. Yeah. See, that makes more sense than trying to slide the damn thing. Just pry it up. You know, wedge it. Keep prying, yeah. wedge more until you can look in. Yeah. Well, they were trying to. I mean, they must have been trying to. Pr there's evidence of people trying to pry those. I damn think they, up. they. Yeah, they couldn't yeah, actually they couldn't. pry them up. <laughs> they had to slide them. <laughs> it's too heavy to yeah, pry. <laughs> and two, you couldn't get something in there because the because the surfaces are so flat. That's one of the. Yep. And they're, they're so well matched. It's so you couldn't like smash it you know, crowbar in there yeah. and then lever it up. Yeah, but there is evidence, like you said, of them chipping away at that seam Edge. working at it yeah. yeah you can see it like there's damage where people were clearly trying to pry at the lid yep yeah uh and failing therapy man yeah and this is like we just scratched the surface of this damn trip there's so many other things to talk right. about so yeah. many other sides <laughs> it's nuts yeah well i will mention that the, this is the other thing bent pyramid so we we went back mm. to the bent pyramid uh and Ben, isn't this a place that's been open recently, really? I think since 2018, 2019, something yeah. like that. So um, before that, it was closed for a long time, right? It was, yeah. Yeah. So we got into the Bent Pyramid, and there is a, um, there's, once you, you go down the, you go down the descending passage, and you get into the main chamber. You and go down you, the descending passage, you go up a stairway into the main chamber, a really steep stairway. And the main chamber well, is ridiculously tall. It's like yeah. huge corbelled. It's corbelled square. Yeah. So it's like a square room that's successively really getting smaller and smaller as it goes up. Yeah. And then once you get you get to the top of the that chamber, which is done they by built, a, a they built a scaffold, a massive there. scaffold with a la, with Stairways. a with a stairway. So you go around and around and around. You get all the way up to the top, and then there's a what like a robber's tunnel, like somebody cut through. Yeah, I don't know what like it's like. Like rock cut passage, yeah. It's yeah. like what, like 35, 40 feet, something like this. And it's it's not, yeah. I mean, it's been cut through. It feels like it's been cut through the bedrock. Yeah, oh, to connect the, uh, it up to this other whole. To connect it, yeah. So this is this is the interesting. Is it thing. in the bedrock? Really? I thought there was well, masonry. not bed. Sorry, not bedrock. The, the, through this, the core the, blocks. Yeah, the, the core blocks. Okay, not yeah. it's not bedrock. You're right. Yeah. So somebody cut through. Right. Okay. So this is the thing. You once you go once you get up to the top of that big tall chamber that Kyle was talking about you climb the scaffold then you go through this roughly hewn thing into the uh into another passage and the to the right coast. yeah to the right the passage goes for a little way and then it connects to what there used to be a a, a, a rock ceiling doorway there and then there's a an ascending passage that goes all the way out to the outside of the pyramid and in and, and like yeah. opens out way up high on the side of the pyramid below the, but it's still below the bend yeah, of the bent pyramid. If you go to the to the left, it goes into another corbelled chamber uh, with several false floors that have been busted through. <clears throat> mm -hmm. But what's interesting is so that's like a it it seems like originally those were two completely different interior sections that mm -hmm. somebody just connected them by digging through from the one chamber yeah. one, from the one passage into the top of that other chamber. 
But originally, it seems like the py- pyramid builders did not intend those two things to be connected to each other. Yeah, Maybe. it's really strange. Yeah. And but this tunnel that goes through the top is like snaky. Yeah. Yeah. And it's amazing how accurately it meets up with the top of that chamber and that other hallway. Right. <laughs> it's one of those things. Yeah. I scanned it. I mean, who knows? It might have the been they might have been like a a shaft, like the shafts in the Oh yeah, like a great small shaft. That, that, oh, that they, they, they just, just dug along. It. Yeah, and they just uh, hammered their way through it. I mean, that's it could a great be point. Like that. Yeah, because that—that's the whole thing. When they, the stories about that pyramid, about oh there being, God. when they were first clearing that thing out, that there was like a movement in the pyramid, and then all of a sudden a draft comes flowing through there. Like because there's there's those two sliding doors in that east west passageway, right? There's yeah. the, the one that goes out to the to the west side, I think, uh, with that ascending passage. And then there's the other one that's propped up on the bit of wood that you go through, and it's, yeah. it's, it seems sketchy as all hell. It's like, don't touch this piece of wood, right? Because <laughs> otherwise, this giant limestone slab's going to come down, and then there'll be people stuck in the pyramid, right? Until we get some jackhammers up in here and get you out again, right? Like it's, yep. Yeah, it's uh, but there's definitely this mechanism for a sliding door, particularly on that right hand turn, uh, that with the ascending passage, and and there's tales of in of this when this pyramid was first being cleared out about that opening and shutting or something like there's literally that seems to be what it correlates to where something happens and it's oh. now this draft that flows through the pyramid and it's making noise and there's air and then it stops all of a sudden and i think that whole door's been destroyed and removed now but yeah but maybe there was a shaft there maybe the, i mean that's i thought about that too it's because it's like it's almost you know it's this miraculous connection between these two what potentially seem to be unrelated chambers but yeah if you are if your purpose is not for people to move through there, but rather for some air or fluid or something else, yep. then maybe it's just a, like one of those four inch or six inch shafts like we have in the the Great Pyramid. Right. And, and so somebody came and, and dug wanna, through. Yeah. Like, uh, where the fuck amazing. does this go? And you just, you hammer your way through there and follow it. And now I'm thinking the that's, result what you get. that's what the well shaft is in the Great Pyramid. There were, uh, was a shaft. Digging along a small they just, shaft. They just Could've widened been. it out <laughs> so that they could go and to where, and it actually led. Next up. Directly to the Grand Gallery. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we don't know what was there first, right? It right. Definitely, it's, it's, this stuff's been hacked out. Although, I mean, and then somebody must have finished that passage because the, the the top part of the well shaft from the Grand, Grand Gallery is constructed blocks. Right, so yeah. that, that like was already not, there. It's not roughly hewn. That it, was there. Yeah, the constructed blocks. Are you went talking in, about the bottom part? Yeah, the constructed blocks that would have gone in the, and ended with a square hole. It would have had to have been natural the unless they had yeah. some kind of drilling rig that could have drilled that hole because it, it's, yeah. it's in the bedrock. Mm. It is in the bedrock. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, you couldn't right. construct it. That's so true. if it was a natural, like they say... I know now we're switching over to the. <laughs> you didn't even finish your story, but well, no, it, if there was good. a natural, um, say, like a karst, like a cave type of sure. thing for water, like maybe a spring that came up from the subterranean chamber area and went mm. all the way up to the grotto really at the surface. Yeah. yeah. Then somebody followed that and widened it to get in, because like the pyramid builders built over. This natural yeah passageway yeah. through the through the bedrock right that's okay so anyway no that's new idea yeah, based yeah, on new ideas widening yeah, yeah, small yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. passageways okay yeah. wow so I got to climb up that <clears throat> ascending passage in the top upper part of the of the bent pyramid and yeah, I climbed it's I climbed closed, yeah, yeah it's closed off you're not supposed to do it mm-hmm. but the grate that was this, this sort of mesh that they have covering it was sort of pushed aside and Ben was like go for it bro and then I <laughs> so I was like well fuck yeah so I I climbed through there and the whole t- you know I got I got part of the way and I was like I'll just have a look and I got part of the way and I looked up and I'm like well I'll go a little further and I went a little further and then I start I started seeing bits of rope and Ben had told me oh there's a rope hanging down because it gets steep I started seeing fragments of rope, and I'm like, man, I don't even know if I can trust this rope. There's pieces of it <laughs> all over the passage. But I could, and this was crazy because looking up, you're already looking up. It's very steep, and you could see at the end that it's it got steeper, and yeah. then it got steeper again. It looked like it just ramped way up, and I was like, well, 
I'll climb up there a little farther. And I got up to the bottom to, to where the rope ended. And yeah, I was all frayed and falling apart. <laughs> <laughs> and by that point, I was like, I just need to go all the way. I'm all the way up here anyway. And yeah, at the end, you needed the rope because unlike the rest of the ascending and descending passages that we climb around in the pyramids, there's no constructed walkway with slats, convenient slats yeah. that make a stair. And it was slippery and sandy. And so I'm climbing up with the rope uh, and trying not to fall, you know, because if you, if, you, if you slip and fall, you're going to slide all the way down to the you know, most of the way to the bottom of the shaft, basically. But I managed to get all the way up to where the grate was and, and look out. And it's just, it's so weird. You know, you just mm -hmm. wonder what the hell is the purpose of this? There's, you're not going to be moving stuff through there. It doesn't, it's not a great thing for workers to carry materials in and out with. You know, you're hunched. Yeah, you it's way smaller than the other ascending mm -hmm. passages. Even the Bent Pyramid, which has a, you know, a notorious descending passage. This is much... Uh, this is the Bent Pyramid you're talking about. Yeah, it is. Even, yeah. I'm sorry. Even the Bent Pyramid's actual descending passage you climb down in, which is very tight. Which is smaller than other pyramids. Yeah, yeah, this was way smaller than that. It was much narrower, right? And also way shorter. In, like, in other words, it just had a... It was a very small passage, and climbing up that was, was tough because you're hunched way over and you're kind of cr uh, crouch walking. Yeah. Uh, so it just didn't seem like, and it was, and then it just ends way up on the side of the pyramid. You know, <laughs> it's just such a strange feature. Now they had a, there's a metal, there's a series of metal grates up there. So I couldn't poke my head out and look around, which would have been fantastic. But, uh, but the other thing I noticed, which was, and this is something that has been, you know, we've seen in other places in other pyramids is that as you got closer to, the exit, the stonework mm. got finer. And I, I took some video and pictures from like all the way out at the exit. I turned around and looked back in and the stonework is just beautiful going down. But down at the bottom where, where, where I started from the deep inside the pyramid, it was very rough. Yeah. I remember this too from um, other descending passage ways. My doom. Is that where it is? You My go doom. in and it's yeah. just like beautiful... Yeah. I mean, even the the middle pyramid is is kind of like this, right? You go yeah. in and it's just like beautiful construction, <clears throat> right? When you go in, and then after you go down, a certain ways, it gets a little more rough, and yeah, yeah, yeah. My my doom's bang on like that too. It's ma it's be beautiful stonework at the top of that passage, and then it sort of gets progressively rougher as you go down. Yeah, to where it just seems like it's been hacked out of the right the limestone at the bottom. Right, it just makes you wonder. Yeah. Again, now I'm thinking yeah. about small shafts that have been hacked through <laughs> later. Yeah, I don't know. What if that all seems of it like was it's, like that? It's constructed like that. Like that does seem like it's an exit like, or some had some purpose. I mean, there's that's the, the nice thing about them. I mean, it's a torturous bloody pyramid, the bent pyramid, but to go into it, it's one of the harder pyramids to go through yeah. physically. But it's real. It's quite nice when you get up into that east-west passageway because there's a nice. There is literally a breeze. There's this like yep. airflow that's, that yeah. goes through there. Yeah, yeah. that's another. It really kind of reminded me of a like a pressure relief. You know, you can yep. imagine the side of the pyramid is just. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Comes yeah, out of that yeah. thing way up high. Yeah, yeah. It is doing yeah. that. I, I was noticing that. Like, like I was, you know, uh, among the last few people that left that pyramid. And just standing in that, when you go to the juncture between the little, what we're calling sort of the the robber tunnel or whatever you want to call it, between the main chamber and that upper whole section, there's just this, yeah. this beautiful breeze coming through there. Yeah. And that's just natural, what, convection causing that to yeah. happen? I, it's yeah. What is that? It's Well, that, that's the source of all the rumors, like the use of the stories you can hear have been read about when they were first clearing it. Like that's, it's like that switched on and off and then back on again. Wow. It's a very strange story. Like as, as if that breathing. door was opening and closing. Yeah. yeah something. Yeah. Then or it makes a, a noise when the wind picks up like it. Or a prevailing wind or something. I don't know. It's Yeah. 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 It's really interesting. How it's it's just know. a constant flow. Well, it, to me, it seemed like a constant flow through there. Oh, well, it is now. I mean, if there was a door there, I mean, the whole mechanism is destroyed now. Like it's gone. Yeah. 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 Like you can see where it was recessed and it would come in and out because mm -hmm. definitely seems like a mechanism. But yeah, um, 
Yeah, that one's a mystery. The Bent Pyramid's enigmatic. It's uh, one of the stranger pyramids, man. It's it is weird. You know, it's like you have that corbelled main chamber, and then you've got this weird recessed corbelled chamber off the side of it as well. Like right. there's another corbelled chamber that they've sealed up. Yep. Almost like they were practicing something. I don't know. It's I don't know what to make of the Bent Pyramid. Um, and the only one where the casing blocks are like tilted in towards the structure. Yep. Yeah, which, which is, is why it's still most yeah, of them are still there. Yeah, to me, I'm like maybe they figured out like I don't know, <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> why did they make it this way? Was it? I don't know. It just it's it's like every other casing off of every other pyramid was completely robbed. I want to know if the casing stones above the bend are tilted inwards. I bet they're not. I think the casing stones below the bend are tilted inwards to support that upper. It helps support that upper section, maybe. That's a good idea. Yeah, I don't know. Don't know. Shit don't wasn't either. a mistake, I don't think, though. Yeah, no. I mean, that's like the a mistake. orthodox explanation. It's like, well, he was practicing building pyramids because this was allegedly <laughs> yeah. the like... third pyramid ever built, right? The bent pyramid. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, so step pyramid, my doom, bent pyramid, red pyramid. It seems like you could practice Great with something smaller. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the other thing. It's like that's the, <laughs> the stupidity of calling it a mistake. Yeah. It's like, why did you finish it? Yeah, right. Like, why did you finish it? Like, if it's a mistake and you got to the join and you're like, oh, shit, this thing's going to be way too steep. We need to change the angle. Well, you know what? Yeah, they don't figure it out. We're going to build another one anyway. Like, <laughs> let's, just... like we're going to, well, damn it, Johnson, we're finishing this shit anyway because right. that's the contract. I don't know. Like, no one like, ever like, drew it out and figured out that it's going to be really tall. Yeah. You know? So <laughs> yeah. And you you can also, that's another area we noticed that at Dashiell too, right? It's like, it's sand dunes, there's sand everywhere. There's quite clearly a lot of foundation and, and floor work that had to happen before you could plop a pyramid out there in the desert. Yeah. Uh, there was a lot of work that went into preparing the site beforehand as well. It's not Yes, like that's right. They just built it on sand dunes or something. <laughs> <laughs> and there's the interesting, Yusuf was pointing out that, you know, there, there there's this weird uh, like conglomerate that's kind of poured around some areas. Oh, it looks like God, it was poured in. Yeah. Yeah. Like they were using a very rough kind of concrete almost. Now, this yeah, is, when we, we say don't that, know. Like, yeah, we don't know, but it's. Uh, I really it's like want Flint. to there's, there's look all at this, this. There's all this river rock and Flint, and it's it's in it's embedded in a strata, like in a yeah, in in some sort of what would you call it, like a. It, it, it's, it's embedded in a matrix it, that's holding a matrix. All, yeah. yeah, and we saw it at Saqqara in particular around the Winis Pyramid, and it's like they you, almost as if and, and you there's actually like there's a channel cut next to it, which is cool because then you can see like the strata lines and yeah. you can see how deep it is, and it's this and it's not like this is natural material for this area, right? And it hasn't been brought in in modern times, and it's the foundation of the pyramid, and in some of this. Some of the shafts around that pyramid, you can also see it in the top level. It's almost as if they use this material to level out the site. Right. Yeah, on basically first. one side. Because I walked to the yeah, other one side, side and it's yeah. it's definitely not there and the bedrock's exposed right. on the other side. Right. And Yusuf was right. showing us how like the the limestone that it's sitting on top of would have these deep cracks and the stuff had poured in and filled those cracks up. You know, which is like just which would you could happen naturally, but it was just very interesting to look at it. How well, it's, it's clearly yeah. come in after the fact. You know, yeah, that that and was the tricky thing about it, and this is one of the reasons why I wanted Chuck to look at it. We didn't get the opportunity, but the big channel that you're talking about that we we could, you can walk down in. It's like you think of a Sakara. Yeah, you think of a flood or some, I don't know, something cut this big channel, and the channels want running one direction. And you're looking at the wall of that channel or that ravine or whatever, and you see the conglomerate stuff up there, and it's filling cracks of erosion in the bedrock yeah. that are running perpendicular. to Yes, that's right. Perpendicular that channel, right. to the channel. So it's like if the channel was natural, if this ravine was natural, then naturally you would have perpendicular smaller channels of from water running into this bigger yeah. channel, right? Yeah. Mm. So that erosion coming from the sides is there going into the bigger channel that's and then washing it down. Mm -hmm. If those if that conglomerate stuff was laid down in a flood, it would have been a big flood, which yeah. means it would have been running the direction of the big channel. Yes, yeah, right. Not the small not little the channels small feeding into the big one. That's right. 
Yeah. And it would have, to like what I thought is, it should have leveled those little ones out. Yeah. Yep. But it's not. It's actually filling them very precisely. Yeah. Preserving them. So yep. it doesn't look like it was laid down in a big flood. Right. It looks like it was poured. Yeah. And there's another sort of factoid to fry your noodle out there is is that this also seems to be the material that we saw inside the grotto. That's, that's right. right. In, the, in, in the Great Pyramid. Right. right. Which is the cavern that's just below ground level, essentially. And it's, you know, the video and footage I've seen from there, it just like that seems to be that same type of material. Right. It looks the same. Like and it's flint right at ground nodule. level. Yeah. yeah. Flint nodules yeah. in some kind of fine matrix matrix yeah. material that is that is concreting those flint nodules and quartz Mm -hmm. smoothed, rounded, like river... River rock style. Rock yeah, gravel. Polished. Yeah. Gravel. gravel. And, po and cobbles. <laughs> so, so yeah, if if you if you had a, a deposit, like a sedimentary deposit of all these flint nodules that were river, you know, uh, washed and, and uh, smoothed and rounded, and then you collected all that stuff and you washed that stone and you had all these basic, you know, just like we do today... You mine, you you dig, you mine it all, you wash it, you sift it, you get all the roughly the same size stones. You're not crushing it, so they're all polished by the by whatever ancient river they were in. Then you mix it with some type of concrete material, <clears throat> and you pour it. That's right. what it looks like. That's what it looks like. And when we last year, when we crawled down into the uh, um, Mastaba, Mastaba seventeen. 17. I noticed this stuff when I was crawling through that tunnel going down into Mastaba 17. I was looking at the walls. I was crawling on my knees. I was like hitting these really hard, like what? And I grab them, looking at them. And I'm like, this is like polished flint nodules, mm -hmm. like nice round. Yeah, oval, river worn flint, and whatever. River worn yeah. flint nodules. And the walls were completely made of it, but it's, and I'm touching the walls and it's like, this is like concrete. It's hard. Yeah. And so I'm wondering, like, did they actually pour that all over the top of whatever the construction underneath Mastaba 17. Yeah. It's weird. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it this, yeah, this trip really, I, I was looking at that stuff everywhere. And then when we were at the, you know, at the red pyramid, those Flint nodules are strewn all They're over everywhere. the ground yeah. around the red pyramid. Yeah, yeah, and I'm yeah. thinking like, okay, this is, this is foundation concrete Yeah, for, whatever mm. construction they were doing. So it'd be, it'd be really cool to, you know, if, if that's true, you could maybe look for that type of deposited material in other places in Egypt and say, Hey, this is a foundation. Yeah. 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 Or a roof in, in, in oh, the case right. of Mustafa 17, it's yeah. like they poured it over the entire thing and very deep. Yeah. That would have been a yeah. big I mean, it is pour. Deep. Yeah, that was a big ass hole I dug for that whole structure at Mustaba Seventeen. When when Petrie found it, he had to dig quite a lot <laughs> to, to eventually find the roof of that thing. He cut that sucker in half trying to look for it. Mm. So. Well, yeah, man, gentlemen, should we call it? It's been a great show. Uh, I don't want yeah. to. Yeah, <laughs> keep this talking. Great. We, can, yeah, we can do more. Uh, we have yeah. many more to come. Well, we'll yeah, we, we got it. We'll get Chuck on. We'll, we'll the small brain geologist who did the wait, well. Okay, before we go, because we last thing, because we skipped past this that Chuck did the taste test on the goo. Like, did you say that? That's <laughs> he did. He did. Yeah, we did. Did. we talked about okay. that up front. Yeah, Mr. well, you, on you the just goo. you mentioned it, but you but he did. We he did legit do a taste test. Okay, he like he, and I did throw up a little bit in my mouth when he said it. <laughs> And, uh, Chuck, dude. <laughs> so he just swiped some on his finger and licked it, right? That's like, he doesn't give a, <laughs> yeah. did not give a fuck. Okay. Like, All right, man. Good give deal. Give a couple days, see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> all right, guys. This is awesome. Yeah. Fantastic trip. More shows to come. Thank you all for... Giant middle finger for all of you in the back of the bus. <laughs> yeah. 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 Middle finger to the back Everybody of the bus. Everybody else uh, that came with us on the Egypt trip, I love you. Yeah. We always have. <laughs> always will. <laughs> Good night, Adamu. Get back to work. Right. So we ended the recording with Ben there, but there was a couple extra things that uh, we wanted to say uh, at the end here. Number one, 
make sure to check him out, UnchartedX.com and the Uncharted X channel on YouTube. He also has Uncharted X Live and some other stuff. Ben's got a lot of great work. If you're not familiar with it, you should be. Definitely go watch everything he's got. He also has a podcast, yeah. so you can check that out. And he does weekly streams, almost weekly. He's got a lot of content. It's really good. He's a fantastic researcher. Yeah, he streams his video game playing, too. He does. I actually was in... Oh, the video game stream last uh, night. We were playing old Warhammer together. Okay. And, uh, yeah. Right. Yep. Yep. I uh, plan to stream my checkers game. <laughs> um, you should stream. Really good. You should stream you working in Logic. People would love that. <laughs> okay. Dude, just watch you making music. I could do that. Yeah, that would be great. I'm. Uh, I don't know if I could work on vocals in front of people. Though. Well, you don't have to do that, but you can show. I was them. like running around hiding and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, yes. So this is the other thing. At the end here, we're putting in uh, a song that Kyle made at the end of the tour. So it's like the tour ended, but Ben and Kyle and I had another five or six days. And we were sitting in a hotel in Cairo near, like right next to the plateau, ne just a street over from Yusuf's shop. And there was a, a cafe on the top floor, like you could go up. Upper on the deck, upper open, deck, and just look like, out in the three pyramids right there was oh absolutely God. amazing. And Kyle sort of brought the guitar up, started playing, and then he just got in the zone and got totally focused. And for the next two days, we barely saw him because <laughs> he's just writing. And he found out that he could had a full studio on his phone, right? <laughs> and he was like, "Dude, yeah, it's like, <laughs> well, I've had GarageBand on this phone, but I've never used it, and I just started using it." I came up with this little guitar riff and I recorded it on GarageBand with my, like, with my headphone. Like, I had my, I brought some wired headphones because yeah. with the Bluetooth, there's a latency issue. Like, yeah. it's, there's a delay. So I had the wired headphones. I plugged them in and it's got the little mic that's like dangling over by your right cheek, you know? And uh, I just kind of like was real careful not to move and I played the guitar and it, I was like, damn, sounds pretty good uh, through the little yeah headphone microphone. And then I just started messing with the synths on there and just like, I just zoned out. I started playing, like it has like, you bring up the piano and the piano keys show up on the phone and you can just push the notes with your fingers. And yeah, I saw you doing that, playing the piano so like, on the phone playing the piano screen. on the phone, <laughs> <laughs> like playing the violins on the phone. I was just like, yeah, this, <laughs> learning this app, it was great. I was just like, I can't believe I'm walking around with this thing in my freaking pocket all yeah, the time. This is yeah. amazing. Yeah. After doing all the scans and everything, and uh, that was blowing my mind that I'm like carrying this thing around and I can scan this stuff. And yeah. It's just like, yeah. So, anyway, I uh, had a moment of inspiration and uh, yeah, it lasted many days. And I just, I wrote this song. So, we're going to play it for you here at the end. It's, uh, a, it's a draft, not done. That is fantastic. Still got to get folks. Still got to get the, the first time I got to listen to it, he handed me the headphones. <clears throat> while we were in Sharm El Sheikh walking around in that Vegas area and I walked around there playing the song in my head and I was just like, this is fucking awesome. <laughs> Thanks, so bro. I really, I really think you guys are going to like it and you can hear the inspiration of Egypt in it. Uh, so yeah, enjoy that for sure. All right. Thanks everybody. Thank you guys.
soul I pray for peace to be with you in your home in this world we cannot blame for all the suffering we bear may it someday wane in this world we cannot change and all the wonders that we share No!